হ্যাঁ অর্পণ ওকে a very good morning to all the dignitaries present here i am monalisa chakraborty from the department of computer science and engineering of dr visira engineering college heartily welcome you all in this five days online fdp on advancement of cyber security technically sponsored by ieee kolkata section before going to the brief of our fdp at first we start with the inauguration program so now may i please request our principal sir dr sanjay s power kindly inaugurate the event with his precious word yeah uh, i uh, inaugurate or say that the function is open and uh, maybe do you want to me speak to welcome address in me now itself or uh, afterwards yes sir uh, now itself okay Uh, yeah. Welcome, delegates. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, for this uh, FDP program on uh, cyber security, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, one of my interest and research area also. And that, that's what I'm more keen on this activity is also. Uh, what is more important in this area, as uh, some of us are going through this activity, is there is a has been a lot of a huge change in the concept of cyber security, which was 10 to 15 years before, and the cyber security now. even today and the cyber security which has been which is expected to happen in next 5 uh, to 6 year uh, why why the changes has happened is because uh, the things uh, the things have been changing in such a, a fast manner that uh, the expert also need to ensure that the detection and affection and maybe a correction also happens at that particular level uh, of course again due to the lot of uh, innovative technologies that is coming into picture the hackers and uh, the uh, the technocrats like us and so on we need to be uh, very proactive and uh, always be ahead with respect to the hackers uh, with respect to that and so on uh, need to understand uh, the various aspects uh, of the cyber security specifically uh, from the device point of view from the network point of view uh, probably the systems point of view and understand the mindsets also <laughs> as in this area we have seen there has been a lot of trends and various uh, things uh, coming into picture and of course uh, being uh, a technology area uh, the things which can be changed fast detect fast and uh, used fast in effective effective manner will be uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, gradually this is uh, taking a more part in uh, specifically the problems and solutions in the artificial intelligence uh, in the cyber security uh, growing gradually from maybe 5% 10% and of course maybe after some years you can see almost 50 60% of the problems will be detected uh, by this area so how this will be utilized uh, in uh, what are the trends uh, and how the detection happens and how it will be affected uh, specifically uh, those trends are to be known probably the expert that will be giving a lecture uh, will uh, give an information regarding what were the trends previously what is the present trends and what will happen next in future etc and so on and the way to fight uh, with respect to this to correct this uh, methodology Uh, of course, um, uh, people will go through the algorithms and so uh, look into the manner where uh, you have a proprietary software as well, open source, open source software also. Uh, but in case of an open source, many times I have been saying uh, you should be a more technocrat, you should be more uh, innovative, you should be uh, having more knowledge to use um, open sources. Almost all the things you have a solution in open source also. But I think one or two sessions will be there with respect to the open source uh, activities uh, in the cyber security area. So I will welcome once again the delegates uh, uh, and the speaker, and I'm sure this five days program will ensure that you are taking care of uh, today's at uh, the cyber security world and uh, be uh, working, or at least uh, be and uh, seed information to you to ensure that you are working uh, from the professional point of view. So, so welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We will surely look forward to your enlightened part. Now, uh, currently, I am going to the brief description of our uh, college. Doctor B C Ra Engineering College is one of the prime private engineering college in West Bengal, <laughs> established in the year of two thousand and affiliated to Macau. Since its inception, the college has gradually earned its reputation as an esteemed Uh, destination of learning in engineering technology management and computer application with fundamental concept and depth understanding of subjects with hands on training and capacity building and leadership skill bcrc with the approval of aict has come a long way it offers 
four M.Tech programs, nine B.Tech programs, and two postgraduate program in management and computer applications. Spread over a large area of about seventeen acres, VCRC multi-storied building of every separate department, a central library, a recitation area, games and sport arenas, multi gyms, state of arts laboratories for all subjects, including the English language. The institute has already earned NBA accreditation for five B.Tech program, and the institute is accreditation with B plus grade by NAC. Our department of CSE, which is also established in the year of 2000, offers a four-year B.Tech and two-year M.Tech program in CSE through conscious, meaningful, devoted, and determined effort of all the stakeholders at our department. We work hand in hand together. with a vision to transform the department into a central excellence of computer science and engineering our mission is to prepare the student for direct employment in various computer science and computer engineering related careers pursuit of higher studies and for research or entrepreneurship in the field by imparting them quality and value based education as per the needs of the society now we will look forward to our session 
during this five days fdp on day 1 the in the session 1 the speaker is dr devashish de professor macout west bengal session 2 speaker dr joydeep havladar assistant professor nit durgapur session 3 speaker bivas chatterjee special public prosecutor on cyber law and evidence llm on day 2 in session 4 speaker dr sharmishtha niyogi lahiri professor jadavpur university session 5 speaker professor anand prabhu majundar assistant professor bcrc durgapur session 6 speaker bubu bhuya professor nehu silong on 24th of august session 7 dr shubhamoy chongdar assistant professor nit durgapur session 8 speaker sabitri chakraborty general manager wipro limited session 9 speaker sonnendu chakraborty assistant professor nit arunachal pradesh with spring in our uh, state curiosity in our mind anticipation in heart we are extending a heartly welcome to you all today we all have joined in the platform of online five day faculty development program on advancement of cyber security technically sponsored by ipcc kolkata section so let us begin our first session which is on drone cyber security by professor dr devashish de devashish de is a professor department of computer science and engineering at moulana abul kalam azad university of technology west bengal india he received mtech from the university of calcutta in 2002 and phd from jadavpur university in 2005 He is a senior member IIIT fellow IIT and life member of CSI. He was awarded the prestigious Boyskas fellowship by the Department of Science and Technology Government of India to work at Heriot Watt University Scotland UK. He received the NGO Watt fellowship award from 2008 to 2009 by DST Australia to work at the University of Western Australia. He received the Young Scientist award both in 2005 in new delhi and 2011 in istanbul turkey from the international union of radio science belgium in 2016 he received the jc bose research award by iit new delhi in 2019 he received shiksha ratna award from the government of west bengal he established the center of mobile cloud computing from iot application he is vice chair of due computing stc of ipcc computer society he produced 20 phd student he published in 320 journals and 200 conference paper 15 books and filed 10 patents his age index is 36 and citation 6200 listed in top 20% scientist list of the world Stanford University USA his research interest is cloud computing iot and quantum computing now may i please request dr devashish sir to please continue mm. very good morning thank you madam for your thank kind you. introduction thank you sir and good morning to all the participants so today i am just going to discuss about some of the recent trends of uh drone computing where actually i'll be discussing on the cyber security domain uh, of uh, drone computing and uh, this drone computing becomes essential because a lot of attacks are happening and uh, everywhere in the world using the drones and uh, and the various kinds of drone technologies are coming up so i'll be discussing the the introduction to the basics of uh, drones and how it works then i'll be going towards the advanced part how this uh, drone security systems works right so let me share the screen okay so let's start with this uh, very interesting topic of drone cyber security 
as you know the theme of this workshop is uh, cyber security as monalisha madam was talking about and uh, i will be discussing on the cyber security with respect to drone okay so this is the agenda for today's uh, topic that first i'll be discussing the basics of drone how it works and uh, how this drone computing works what are the various application domains of drone computing then directly i'll go to the drone cyber security areas and also drone forensics so these are the four components that we'll cover try to cover today so as uh, madam has mentioned that uh, center of mobile cloud computing where we actually we work on the various mobile data so these are the mobile devices and we are accessing the data from the cloud to these applications you know that everyone uh, using these apps every day right so these apps are actually controlling the cloud through this uh, mobile phone itself right for example uh, the ola and uber app so we are we don't have the car right but we can access the car using that ola and uber uh, applications right so similarly you know that uh, your drone is also one kind of mobile device right and this device uh, is has a mobility just like your mobile phone you carry we all carry with our uh, hand and whatever with our bags so it is totally mobile similarly drones are also mobile and various applications are there to you know we are connecting them to the cloud so the topic uh, of today's uh, drone computing or drone security will be uh, based on this uh, topic called uh, mobile to cloud or drone to cloud network right so there are various issues there so one of them is data mobility because all the data is are mobile in nature so we'll be discussing on the mobility of the data and uh, there are also vehicular data a lot of vehicles are there you know the you know, drone itself is a vehicle and uh, last month august uh, not last month this month august actually india has uh, started the human traffic means human can also go by drone and we can also pay the load to the drones to transfer the object from one place to other place so drone data drone is also acting as a vehicle in future maybe everyone will be going to your office or your workplace or anywhere to this drone vehicles right you can own your own drone vehicles so vehicular data is very important so we also work in this vehicular domain and uh, we also work on the crowd sensing the data from the crowd and drone data mobility analytics geospatial you know various geographical locations are there so we are also doing this uh, research on geospatial mobility where the geographical boundaries are considered as one of the very important parameters and uh, if the mobility of the system is high then we can say that uh, that the, the city or the city is safe or secure uh, if we can use these drones for city management for uh, uh, usage of the behavior like for example uh, for we can use this drone as a traffic signal control system we can also use a drone as a uh, healthcare service provider we also can use the drone as a, uh, for security purpose or sometimes you know that uh, for a various health applications these drones are used so there are huge amount of applications of drones every day that we use and uh, that makes the city smarter so we also work in this domain of drone mobility to make the smart city environment and uh, there are various algorithms uh, computer science algorithms like gso psos are used for this mobility management so this is the total overview that we'll be using throughout this day uh, on this mobile cloud computing or you can say the drone cloud computing sim right so we will be using this architecture okay. now the question is uh, the clouds uh, whatever we are talking about uh, clouds are actually uh, are a long distance away from us basically uh, if we talk about the cloud like amazon cloud google cloud and it is not in uh, calcutta even calcutta there is no server is there 
in india the servers are in mumbai or in bengaluru somewhere so if you want to do any operation our data will travel from my laptop to bangalore or to uh, mumbai right so it takes a lot of time and uh, delay so for real time operation the cloud is not that much good so recently the edge computing is coming into the picture where we can use the edge devices like your laptop can access the edge device your uh, your drone we can connect you know the drone uh, maybe as a iot device we can connect to the laptops or this kind of devices so we can access the drones using your smartwatch we can access the drone using your mobile phones we can access the drone using your computer so drones uh, can be controlled directly by the edge devices all the times we do not need to go to the cloud because cloud has a lot of delay when the data size is very very high petabyte zettabyte data then only we will go to the cloud otherwise most of the operations will be performed in the edge level so we call it edge computing earlier 20 years before uh, the you know maybe 2000 we are calling cloud computing we have that provide the services like platform as a service software as a service and infrastructure as a service and this three services can be also provided through these edge computing devices that means drones can uh, offload the data to your laptop drones can offload offload means transfer the data from drone to your device so this kind of offloading is possible and it is possible in real time so that is the beauty of the whole edge computing and you can see billions of edge devices is around us right there are only thousands of cloud so you indi it indicates that uh, that for iot applications that means internet of thing application edge computing becomes almost uh, essential right and also security perspective also if your data is moving to a long distance the security is also hampered so using this edge computing we can develop the secure system and also privacy preserving system right so edge devices are so popular nowadays for this kinds of applications okay so you can see there are a lot of applications are there for these uvs for smart uh, homes and also for smart signaling instead of traffic controller we can use these drones for uh, accident chasing or for uh, the cars who uh, actually breaks the traffic rules we can use this uv for smart home applications for healthcare applications and also for smart grid application we are using various bandwidth you know this uh, red color indicates high bandwidth is your indicates a medium and the blue indicates a low bandwidth so we are using various bandwidth based on the application so you now this this uh, drones are actually connecting to each other we call it internet of drones or internet of drone things so that is the beauty that uh, this drones are all talking to each other through the internet and they can share the data exchange their information through the internet so we also call it internet of drone things right and we have to provide the security i'll discuss how we are providing the security and what are the threats uh, will be coming will be discussing throughout the day and uh, yeah so there are a lot of uh, applications in smart cities and uh, for these drones that is the reason you know we have to provide this intelligence you know the ages are learning so we are in the air the drones are learning how to move and how to move without any collision the drones are moving without any collision so so drones are learning means they are gathering the data they are capturing the videos they are capturing the audios they are capturing uh, all the informations and they are learning in the air so it is a basically air networking air based networking and uh, so we have to provide the security to the drones in the air so that is a challenge also and also we have to provide the security and also the privacy security privacy is not same security means you have to provide you know you have to defend it, the drones from the enemy privacy means the identity of the drones will not be disclosed okay so we have to develop the distributed learning system distributed machine learning systems which will provide this connection with a privacy preserving manner and that is already done and that is already uh, in use right so so that you know the enemy drones cannot hack your drone right so privacy should be preserved so this is a very important so 
that is the reason the these drones are landing in the air okay air means the sky you know it's landing in the sky so you know that uh, this this uh, drones are actually moving on the sky so drones are also mobile device also this uh, doing the intelligence in the edge so it is also using this edge computing so we call it mobile edge computing edge means the edge devices and drones are the iot device you know so they are connecting to the nearby laptops or nearby servers and we have to provide this intelligence how it is possible so we have to use this artificial intelligence ai or machine learning to these drones okay using this mobile edge computing platform so this is a confluence of mobile edge computing with the ai so this is a definition that uh, how this mobile edge computing works we can access the multi access edge computing called mobile edge computing that uh, is providing the services like cloud like services okay all the three services platform software infrastructure three services we can get it from the edge similar to the cloud network right so those who are interested uh, they can go through this book and uh, where we have published this book of 22 chapters on mobile edge computing where uh, you know that we have discussed about the various algorithms of mobile edge computing in the architecture or the whole system of this mobile edge network and this book is also published uh, this year where we are providing this intelligence to the drones okay or iot devices so these books are available freely so anyone is interested uh, they can go through it right now the question is uh, what kind of intelligence you have to provide and what are the types of intelligence right so when the intelligence is happening means we are providing this various uh, deep learning or transfer learning or uh, this uh, various kinds of machine learning techniques in the central cloud level we call it centralized intelligence or centralized learning and uh, when it is happening in the lower level means middle level in the base stations and the servers in the mobile edge devices we call it local learning okay and when the terminals are learning that means the uh, drones are learning in the air we call it terminal intelligence right terminal intelligence means can anyone say what is terminal intelligence yeah mobile yeah that means any mobile device or any you know moving vehicle or any car or drones if it has intelligence you know we can simply add a raspberry pi or any iot device to the drones and we can provide this kind of machine learning algorithms you know it's freely available everywhere in github and everywhere so uh, machine learning is so popular subject nowadays and we are we are providing this intelligence to the drones so that the drone can take their in, uh, decision by themselves right isn't it so they are all intelligent devices the cars are intelligent you know autonomous cars autonomous robots okay so they can take their own decision so this is the target we have to provide the intelligence we have to provide the learning in the drone level means every drone must be intelligent enough to take their own decision where to fly how to avoid the collision right i think you have seen the drone lighting systems right in various uh, platforms in uh, olympic even in uh, in india also uh, drone lighting systems are very popular so we are making various patterns on the sky so every drone is making this pattern on the sky have the intelligence has a software it is basically software defined drones which has the intelligence and this intelligence is called terminal intelligence and we need this terminal intelligence because we should not take all the data from the cloud because a lot of delay is there right you don't want to delay will be there if you want to go for this drone to uh, base station and base station to cloud for central intelligence then uh, you know that by the time accident will happen by that time real time monitoring is not possible so in order to perform the real time monitoring real time intelligence real time security we need terminal intelligence 
okay this is very very important term that i'll be using throughout the day okay so we have to do the computation caching cache memory and also the data so these are the three important part for this time in intelligence so we have to develop the drones or these edge devices or this uh, edge intelligent devices in such a manner it must have the time in intelligence also nowadays the drones are called autonomous drones they can fly by themselves they can take their own decisions right See, for example uh, this is a very interesting picture uh, of uh, autonomous drone where the drones can fly like a bird you know this is a famous uh, quotation you know who is a singer anyone shondha no ja pakhi utte dilam toke bujene onno kono bhasha very interesting popular song by whom anyone i can see 60 participants are there mil mil uh, mil song yeah yeah It's very very popular song. Uh, okay. And it shows that birds can fly by themselves. You know that if bird can see object, they can fly like anything. Similarly, why the drones will be always governed by the base station? Generally, we control the drones by the base station. But nowadays, people has developed the you know that scientists has developed the uh drones which can fly by themselves they are called autonomous drone right for example uh, uh these autonomous drones can fly any accident say suppose there is accident two person is lying on the ground and drones are somewhere in the area so drone will fly they can sense some accident car accident or something like that they, they can take the picture and uh, say they send the signal to the control station from the picture the control station can understand that what kind of incident there is so that control station will send the ambulance for the hospital so these drones are actually helping for the citizens to provide this uh, safety and security for the citizens citizens right using this edge computing devices and and not only that drones can take the picture and they can analyze the Uh, event whether it is a car accident whether uh, the fire brigade is required then they will call the ambulance as well as they will also call the fire brigade to stop the fire if some fire incident is happening nearby so drones are intelligent drones from the accident scene they can understand what kind of emergency measure they have to take right so this is the beauty of intelligent autonomous drones intelligence why because they can take their own decision and they can analyze the event or incident that is the reason they are called intelligent using this machine learning techniques and uh, computer vision techniques right you no know, using yolo algorithm and various other algorithms uh, there to understand the pictures to understand the human beings so accordingly the action will be taken so these autonomous drones are very popular nowadays and and a huge amount of uh, business is happening around the world even in india also huge uh, uh, you know investments are coming for this autonomous drones right and there are various applications uh, agriculture smart city transportation battlefield surveillance power huge applications are there even in mining industry they are also using these drones to save the rainforest but most of the highest application in infrastructure you can see huge amount of business is happening in the uh, infrastructure that means uh, smart city management also in the second is in agriculture drone applications so transport management security yes today's uh, topic security border security you know that uh, most of the countries border security is you know that uh, even in siachen you know that uh, our soldiers military they are working day and night in the minus temperature right minus 50 minus 40 minus 30 so very dangerous uh, situation is there so this drones can will be used you know that in very low temperature zone to for the safety and security for the integrity of our country 
So border safety and security is drone is playing a major role. So that part I will be discussing in detail today. Okay. So in agriculture, so in order to serve the agriculture fields, you know, multiple drones are coming up to areas where the things are affected. So there are a lot of applications are there. And drones can handle huge amount of data, big data. Big data means volume, velocity, and variety. Three Vs, right? Volume, velocity, and variety. Three Vs. So drones are like, you know, they can carry, carry a huge amount of data, especially when the IoT is coming into picture, see, when IoT is coming to the picture, drones are actually carrying huge amount of data. So it is similar to like an elephant, right? Elephant means it, it looks like small, but it is uh, equivalent to elephant. Means it can carry huge amount of uh, data. So drones are like this, and we are using the small lightweight technologies like SSD drives. You know that we also use SSD for our laptops or computers or lightweight uh, technology right solid state devices so drones are uh, nowadays like uh, superman which can mandrake or kind of things that they can fly and they can do all the operations by, which is even not possible by the human being so drones are equivalent to a superman kind of thing right now when you are talking about this drone network uh, this drone network is not available for this uh, you know that on the earth surface also it is working in the underwater so it's called aquatic underwater vehicle or AUV we call it UAV for on the sky unmanned aerial vehicle also aquatic also sometimes we use the ground uh, drones right so we have to cover you know the on the sky on the ground as well as in the under, under the water so you know that uh, we call it three loc, right? That means you have to connect all the three networks together using these drones. And we are connecting them through the internet. Internet is uh, makes it possible to connect all of them so that all of them are integrated together. And they are providing the safety and security for us, for the human being, for the society, right? Now, uh, drones has a lot of features that they can fly by themselves. Already I have mentioned that autonomous drones, they can crawl and they can talk to each other. It's very important. This is IoT. IoT makes it possible to connect devices and they can exchange the information and also control. One drone can also control other drones. They can recognize the faces and objects. They can climb. They can grab the any objects and most important part is that they give each other space. That means, what is the very important part? That uh, drones will never collide. You have seen thousands of drones are flying like a bird. Have you seen the birds collided? Anyone seen birds colliding uh, with themselves and falling on the ground? So they have the natural instinct. So this we have to provide this intelligence to the drones. So that they will never collide. When drone lighting systems comes on the sky, then uh, you know that uh, they never collide. They make various patterns, right, on the sky. So this is very important that the drones can give each other space. Okay. Even some for security reasons that they can recognize the faces and and for the criminals they can catch the criminals. You know that and is helping the police to recognize the faces and all these things. So there are, these are the basic features of the drones. And PwC, you know that PwC company in 2016, they have given this forecast. And this is actually happening around us, right? So this is some of the drones in our laboratory. So what I've this said that uh, we are working on this IODP, called Internet of Drone Things. Where more than one drones are connected here, showing four drones are connected to the cloud edge network, and they are connecting each other. They are exchanging information, and they are also controlling each other. This drone can control each other. And these are some of the properties that they can communicate. Their drones are also intelligent enough to handle the data. So we are calling it intelligent drones. 
and it also support the edge devices edge applications dual level processing for load balancing so these are the features of the drones that already have mentioned drone can also act as a data collector yes it stores when it flies on the sky uh, say calcutta sky uh, then that can capture the images of calcutta and they can store it either in the device memory device or you can connect to the cloud or edge devices they can transfer the data possible those can fly high or low altitude and establish the ad hoc link between the ground station and the nodes or the edge devices okay so there are huge amount of applications of the drones so already i have mentioned the smart city smart home smart hospital the drones can act as a doctor also right for example uh, when someone is ill especially for the senior citizens uh, our parents are at home so the hospitals uh, will send the drone as a doctor they can take care of the patients for minor incidents so this drone will be connecting to the hospitals and they can exchange the information and if required then they will send the ambulance also but initially drone handles the basic uh, services hospital services and uh, this is not the fiction this is already uh, happening around us and uh, drone doctor we call it drone doctor okay this drone doctor is actually helping and providing the services to the citizens even uh, they can provide these prescriptions even drones can blow and go to the uh, delivery of pharmacy products like medicines and all the things to the senior citizens so this kind of services are drone services are available in many countries and uh, and there are a lot of applications in healthcare or patient monitoring okay also there are applications in smart grid applications smart grid right okay. so these are the various tiers of network you can see the this is the eighth tier middle tier is the fog tier fog is the intermediate devices and at the middle we have cloud so cloud fog and edge so these are the three levels of uh, networking devices elements through which these drones are connecting and these autonomous drones are taking their own decisions to make the whole ecosystem uh, much more better for practical applications right so first layer is the perception layer there is a sensing layer second layer is the edge layer and third layer is a gateway layer edge layer i have already discussed what is edge and fog is also intermediate uh, devices and the last layer is a cloud layer but mostly we will work in the edge layer after sensing the data from the mobile devices we will be directly connecting to the edge devices so basically we are we can say that uh, mobile edge computing or mobile edge drone computing is almost synergy so we'll be accessing mostly the edge layers why because it provides security because it is nearby devices we do not have to go to long distance to the cloud at the same time the delay is less aggregation cost is also less okay. and there are various mobility models are there so drones are mobile so they, are, they can move from one place to other place and there are various distance x y z coordinates are there by the direction uh, dn pn and sn how this uh, distance factor is measured so we can measure the velocities like this so one of the model there are hundreds of mod drone mobility models are there one of the popular model is uh, gosh markov mobility model to which we can measure the you know drone mobility on the sky and why these models are important because it it gives you the patterns you know that every system has a pattern so similarly drone mobility has some pattern how this drone will move by the it will be governed by these rules these equations right similarly there are uh, based on the geographical location of your uh, terrain means your landscape so we are using different different mobility models right and this is a very interesting area of research those who are interested in drone research these mobility models are a uh, very interesting area of research especially from communication point of view and computing point of view 
okay because there are a lot of shortest path algorithm dijkstra algorithm and very various other algorithms are there you know there are similar algorithms are used in uh, ola and uber uber app also right they are also using the shortest path and nearby algorithm and resource availability and so many other factors are there so ola uber are also using these mobility models right and there are hundreds of mobility models are used by this ola and uber all these online uh, vehicles right so we have published uh, two years before one work called edge drone to provide this qs qs means quality of service for this uh, mqtt mqtt means is a protocol message queuing telemetric transport protocol mqtt it will act as a middleware and for your uh, iot devices and using this mobile edge computing uh, we are using this in drones so you know this uh, drone computing is so popular nowadays and we have to provide qs qs means quality of service there are various services are available uh, for example this is the drone layers right edge layers and through this drones we can connect it to the either mobile phone or to the routers or to your laptop so these are acting as a edge layer drone is actually acting as a iot device iot to this mobile phone your mobile phone nowadays have uh, 8gb 4gb or maybe 16gb rams right and we in laptops are connecting coming up with 16gb ram so we can connect this drone we can compute compute means we can uh, exchange the information we can offload the data means uh, for last one hour what are the pictures are captured by the drone that will be saved in this laptop instead of going to the cloud we can store it locally but when the data size is very very high and the computing requirement is very high then only we will go to the cloud through this iot so otherwise we will be solving the everything most of the things at least 90% things will be performed in the edge layer 10% case we may go to the cloud if the data size is high if the computing requirement is high is it clear anyone yes so you understand that if we are uh, basically processing our data on the mobile phone itself we can save lot of time delay is less and uh, exchanging of information becomes fast and we can access the drones very easily so cloud age has almost gone i can say, i must say that now it is the age of uh, you know this 2022 or this is the age of uh, edge computing so last uh, couple of years this edge computing is dominating predominating over this cloud services right so for for providing this seamless and real time listen seamless and real time edge computing so at the same time security level is very high because you have to go for only one layer right we don't need the uh, high end security you know very uh, simply we can provide the security you know that various other platforms but when the data will move from uh, various other networks and cloud network see it will go to multi hub 1 2 3 then every level you have to provide security and that cost of security is high because lot of encryption decryption will be happening lot of power requirement will be there so from security point of view also edge computing is much more safer so this is a very very important aspect of today's discussion if you want to uh, develop a cyber secure edge computing based iot internet of drone things then we have to go for single hub edge layer to the iot layers that means here it is drone layer drone layer is iot layer okay so this is a very important ecosystem for secure and also fast real time seamless connectivity for these drones okay and there is a demand right there is a demand for smart city de design so we are using actually this mqtt and mqtt sn these are the two different protocols protocol means uh, the rules and regulations you know there 
these drones are actually, you know, if you see these drones, you know that uh, every drone may have different protocol. Maybe we are using different uh, types of drones. They are, they are using different protocols. We should call it as a heterogeneous drone. And these protocols must be, they can talk to each other. So MQTT and MQTT SN is not same. MQTT is message queuing telemetric transport protocol. This is also MQTT and SN. SN stands for sensor network. So both are not similar, same, similar, but not same. We have to confer, go for interoperability. Anyone know what is interoperability? What is interoperability? Interoperability means we have to convert one protocol to other protocol. When you're converting one protocol to other protocol, we call it interoperability. It is similar to that, uh, that uh, some people know Hindi, someone is uh, understanding only Bengali. So we need a common language to uh, talk to them. So that we need a translator, right? Translator translate from Hindi to English, then the translator translates from Hindi to uh, English to Bengali, so that these protocols can talk to each other. Similarly, if you are using uh, hundreds of drones, maybe they will be using 10 different protocols. So we need to uh, transfer this protocol, means we have to convert, go for interoperability, real-time interoperability, like a translator, right? Which will transfer the uh, one protocol to other protocol, which is very important for uh, exchanging information, right? And moreover, every company, is making their own drones, right? They can, there is no uh, single norms that we have to use this IoT device. Every IoT, you know, there are at least 10 IoT protocols are there. MQTT is there, six slow pan is there. There are various other protocols are there. So we have to convert them to a common language. For example, I'm giving this lecture in English. Why English? Why not in Bengali? Because English is a common language. So similarly, we have to give a common language for the drones so that they can talk to each other using this PTU, Protocol Translation Unit. So this is a very important to exchange, for exchanging information, right? So here are some of the devices what we developed. And this is MQTT, and this is MQTT, and these are the internal circuits of it. And this is connecting to the edge cloud devices, IBM Watson we have used. And there's a protocol we are using TCP, MQTT, all these things, right? Now, what is QoS? Anyone, what is QoS? Quality of service. Yeah. So, uh, can you define what is quality of service? The type of service we are providing, right? The service category. Can you say it, service category? Hello? Service category. That means, uh, say, suppose I'm going to say Digha or Puri, right? And we have long, uh, we have uh, into the hotel, and we there are various uh, hotel rooms are available standard, deluxe, and super deluxe. I'm repeating standard, deluxe, and super deluxe. So maybe it is 3,000, this is 4,000, this is 5,000 per room. So based on the capacity, means your your pocket, your budget, will book the room. So QHG is the providing the basic service where you can stay. QS1 is providing, say, air condition. Uh, QS2 may be providing this room with balcony, with uh, gizar, with uh, also uh, say uh, refrigerator, also television, and various other luxury features. So if we can provide the high-end data quality, then we will go for QS2. When we go for resource constraint, that means your budget is not there. We can only your your, your pocket only permit three thousand rupees. Then we will go for the budget hotel that means a standard room right 
same hotel but three different types of rooms right similarly for iot we are providing this mtt services for three different protocols means three services three types of service qs0 is the basic service qs2 is the highest service let's see what is actually there qs0 provides the publisher and subscriber publisher is one drone subscriber is another drone they want to talk to each other right so they will be going through a broker broker you know that which converts you know the connect one drone to other drones so you are using the mqtt broker which converts the protocol translation and other iot services it simply connects and subscribe subscriber subscribes this data publisher is publishing means it is sending say this drone is sending some image to the subscriber drone then through this mqtt this is actually happening this is a very simple one basic service see here it is two lines and the three lines right if you see go for us1 it is giving acknowledgement so there are either negative acknowledgement or positive acknowledgement it understands okay the data has reached to the subscriber just like our uh, when you send the letter we uh, in the letter what is that there is called uh, acknowledgement part is there right when you submit a letter or we send the letter we can track sometimes you know email also has tracking system we can understand the whether the person read your mail or not right so this is a little bit costly service and complicated also because there are four layers and three layers here providing this acknowledgement and this is publisher drone this is a acknowledgement acknowledgement means subscriber drones pub sub model pub sub model similarly us2 is much more complicated it provides very good high reliable services and all other other features lot of other features are there so it really ensures the data to be reached to the subscriber tones with high quality no degradation but we have to provide high bandwidth for this high quality of uh, a lot cost is little bit higher means communication cost and computation cost here we are talking about drone cost means communication cost and computation cost okay so again it is called pub sub model mqtt mqtt works in the publisher subscriber model so this is another drone talking to this drone so using this broker so broker is acting in between so if you see this uh, you know this is called this is called uh, this this is a publisher drone this is a subscriber drone see one drone one one publisher is sending the data in different time tm and tm1 sending the data to another drone tm2 n number of drones we can connect right dot 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 means n 3 4 5 6 7 8 up to 100 maybe 1000 maybe 1 lakh one drone can send the data to other drones so this is known as master drone or publisher drone and these are all called subscriber drones sub okay and they are providing this different time slots to different drones so it this indicates the self scalability of the system scalability is one of the very important property of uh, internet of things means we can add uh, any number of participants okay in this network so this is called scalability this is called uh, scalability of the system for example we are using now google platform right uh, google platform uh, we are using for this uh, webinar in this, this uh, discussion right so what is the capacity for this uh, this uh, platform anyone can say monal madam is there hello yes sir yeah my question is that uh, what is the capacity for this today's webinar how many participants we can add 100 right yes sir 100 but if you go on to go before beyond 100 what will happen uh, there is a youtube link we are also live streaming on youtube so that they can also join no but yeah that's fine but at the same time yeah. if you want to allow say 1000 uh, participants in this google means uh, google meet okay then you have to go for subscription right yes sir yes sir 
So you understand that we now we are using basically basic services that is QS0. Yes. Okay. For higher services, you have to pay for it. Agree? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this is the model. This is the this is called scalability. So okay. in this Google platform or Gmeet platform, we have a limitation that we can allow hundred drones or hundred users. So in the in this publisher, for example, I am working as a or Mona Lisa Madam or uh, he she is the organizer. I am just giving this talk now. So we are the publisher, and the participants are subscriber, right? They are listening, they are interacting. Yes. So yes, limitation sir. is yeah, limitation is actually hundred. So if you want to go for higher level of service, you have to buy for higher service. That means QS one or QS two, right? So scalability is one of the very important issue for these drones, right? Okay. So we also worked in this uh, domain called intelligent grip. So drones are also using these uh, services for these power grids. Power grids also we can uh, drones can provide. If power grid power grid failure is there, the high end drones are there which can provide the service, provide temporary electricity services to the drones. So this is called power grid services. So so we also worked in this power grid domain. In some areas when there is a failure. These drones can provide the power grid service. So it is a high-end drone, not the normal drone, and uh, temporarily provide service for giving the service to the citizens, right? So those are interested, they can go through these power grid drone applications. These are the, some of the drones for to use in our laboratory. This is a base station, ground control unit. This is a drone, and this is a, a visualization things, right? And this is a helicopter. Helicopter means one, two, three, four, five, six. Six uh, arms we have, six uh, drones we have, right? Now, these drones can also work in underwater. And uh, you can see these underwater drones are also available in Amazon. Those who are interested in underwater drones. As I mentioned, that you have to connect the three lobes, means uh, on the sky, on the ground, as well as under the water. So we have to use these underwater drones. And we can connect this underwater drone to the UAV so that we can have a uh, Edge level connectivity from one drone to other drones. Underwater drones can also talk to our UAVs, right? To provide the security under the water, also also the above the sky, right? So by this way, we are connecting the whole world. So that is the beauty of whole system of IoT. We are calling Internet of Things or Internet of Everything. We are connecting everything in this world using these drones, right? And providing this safety, security, and services for the citizens. Okay. So this is one of the one of our work called uh, modeling and simulation of edge drone using software defined underwater things. So uh, underwater things are very important because you know that seventy percent of our earth is water underwater, and uh, most of their things are unexplored. So underwater drones are actually exploring the unexplored things under the water. So we also working in this domain of underwater things or underwater drones, which can give you the information and the security under the water, right? Especially for the submarines, they use the drones for uh, whether they which direction they will move, and they are getting the signals from the underwater drones, right? So drones, uh, we call it also drone chain. You know that blockchain is another very interesting area where we are connecting the Blocks each and every drone acting as a block, and we are connecting this drone as a chain. And this, you know, using this Ethereum, I think everyone knows because blockchain is a buzzword nowadays. I think today also uh, maybe there will be some lecture. I have seen that there will be lecture on blockchain, so I'm not going in detail of it. This blockchain also provides the <laughs> connect the drones, so intruder cannot enter to the drones. Means uh, in the drone chain. We also call it drone chain, drone chain, drone with blockchain called drone chain. Okay, so this is also very popular, providing these edge-based services. Okay, we have written one book for uh, all this blockchain-based IoT. One of the chapter is on drone chain. Okay, so those who are interested, they can go through it. And also. While we are using these drones, we are using also some of the bio-inspired algorithm or nature-inspired algorithm 
for the drones. Can you say what is this? Anyone? What kind of worm it is? Anyone has seen this worm? This is very common. Junaki, junaki poka. Junaki poka, yes. As we call it glow worm. In Bengali, we call it junaki poka, yes. And if you see the, actually we have to mimic the, the behavior of this worm. What is that? These worms are flying on the sky, right? On the uh, some cave. This is a picture uh, taken from a cave. Okay, in from in, I took it from this website. This glow worm moves on the sky, but see, they're making beautiful lighting systems, but they never collide. And this is the uh, this is the inspiration for drone lighting system. Okay, which is so popular nowadays. And this glow worm is the inspiration for drone lighting system. Those who are using it. Uh, you know, Junaki or this glow worm is very much uh, used. To, uh, so, what we are doing, we are actually mimicking this uh, flying behavior of this glow worm or Junaki. We call it nature inspired algorithm. We, are, we call it GSO, glow worm swarm optimization, like PSO. So, they will never collide, but at the same time, they can design very interesting patterns on the sky. So, that is also providing the safety and security for the drones. Drones will move on the sky, they can fly freely, but they will never collide using this GS algorithm. So some of the scientists in uh, Ali Khan, they have developed in 2019, that self-organized planet, planet means flying out of network using the GSO. 2019, they have published this work called self-organized planet, where they have developed this, uh, they've shown that if this, these drones follow this GSO algorithm, I think PSO everyone know, particles from optimization. It is similar to PSO, we call it GSO, glow worm swarm optimization. We are actually mimicking this behavior to these drones so that the drones will never collide. And we can form the clusters, we can form the flying behaviors, everything. Okay. So see, dynamic subgrouping is possible. Dynamic subgroups are possible. So this is a picture shows the clusters, multiple cluster of drones, like the multiple clusters of glow worms, they're flying on the sky, but they will never collide if you use this GSL algorithm. This is showing the flust, uh, cluster formation using the GSO. Similarly, uh, based on this working principle of uh, clustering and anti-collision uh, drones, we also worked uh, in 2020, uh, last uh, two years before, that we also use this uh, GSO for movement score based uh, mobility approach. Okay. So this is a big area. I'm not going in detail of it. But just I want to show you, I want to give the message that we are using this GSO or RGSO. We call it reverse GSO. So reverse GSO shows that uh, it is showing two things. One is uh, anti-collision, also energy efficiency. Because energy is very important because drones are Moving on the sky, they have limited battery lifetime. So we have to make it energy efficient as well. So this RGSO is also playing a major role for movement. So we published in ad hoc network. In uh, ComCom last year also, we worked on this RGSO using this uh, fuzzy system. We got better result and more energy efficient algorithm for this drone movement, right? So these are the, some of the areas actually we are actually using this uh, uh, Globum or this bi inspired algorithms for anti collision system at the same time energy efficient green that's why you're calling it green mobile sensor network or green IoT whatever so, so fuzzy rules are providing uh, better solutions for these drones so so now the question is when you're talking about drone mobility what are the questions that what will be the speed what will be the direction what will be the pattern is the movement is essential? And what is the geographical condition? So there are multiple questions that are coming up. And uh, you know that we have to solve these problems using various algorithms. So for example, you can see this. Uh, this is a very interesting lighting techniques I'm discussing from the beginning. Any, have you, anyone seen this drone lighting live or anywhere? Yes, in Dubai. Yeah, 
in india also in ipl there is a drone lighting okay and iit delhi they have a drone lighting laboratory sponsored by intel also right so if you go to iit delhi website they have a drone lighting systems and company like intel they are providing the service can you believe it see there are very interesting patterns we can uh, build on the sky this is guitar sitar whatever anything we can also make india map this 15th august uh this 15th august 75th uh, you know azadi ke amrit mahotsav so we have celebrated and iit delhi website has seen that they are they are making india map uh, using their software defined patterns means they are defining the patterns and the drones are moving on the sky based on the patterns uh coordinates the drones are making their position and they will not collide but but they are making a pattern very interesting isn't it and it is also pollution free more important pollution free how it happens actually these are the drones you know before they start so this is a 3d lighting system there are various youtube sites are there i'm not going in detail will take a lot of time those who are interested please go through these youtube uh, channels so 3d lighting systems using internet of drone things so these drones are connected together making a cluster so from the ground station what kind of patterns they are providing from the ground station they are we are making this kind of uh, patterns on the sky whether it is a india map or whether it is a guitar whether it is a eagle now the question is if a hacker hack your main computer instead of making this guitar they make something uh, against your country which is uh, not uh, not desired it is possible right so we have to provide this uh, you know that uh, security for these drones so that no can no one can hack you understand instead of india map it makes other countries map so it looks odd right during our celebration so hackers can do it actually hackers actually uh, demotivating us uh, to using even even by this pattern so it happens i know that lot of this kind of thing happens so we have to make this uh, total drone system secure so that the defined pattern will go otherwise what will happen the hacker will provide their own pattern and it will be against your uh, uh, institute or against your country or against your nation right so we'll we should allow them to come into this uh, this domain so it should be full proof so we have to design or develop various algorithms for it right also uh, these drones are used for social iot i'm not going in details or healthcare we have also worked in the healthcare internet drone things for social iot even for 6g 6g is coming in uh, 2030 means after 7 8 years i should not talk about 6g because 5g is not even with us but 6g is coming up in a big way okay many countries already started it so we are also working in this 6g domain working uh, this uh, slicing for this impurity for healthcare also we worked in this qs uh, drones for healthcare using this stride analysis stride means using your movement pattern right anyone know what is stride analysis how the you are walking stride means how you are walking your walking pattern the drones can drones will move around you they can give you that in give information yes what kind of disease you have so that is also helping in healthcare industry drones are actually helping as a doctor for this uh, purpose so two jamont of applications are there now recently we have worked on dew drone even this dew drone can work in the environment where even the internet is uh, not there or absent for a certain period of time what will happen if the internet is absent now then my lecture will stop our total uh, web db will stop right now we are de developing certain technology called dew computing is a very new one i am also working as a vice chairman of this committee uh dew computing usa uh, group so recently we have published one work called uh, dew drone this dew drone can work even without internet for some time means uh, 
if the internet is gone for say two three minutes then all, then also we can connect the system and system will work especially the drones are moving on the sky where the internet connectivity is less so even if they lost connection using their internal cache memory they can connect okay so i'm not going in details of it because it will take another two three hours time so those who are interested they can go through this consumer electronics magazine we published uh, this year just this month august okay so it is an early access okay sometimes it happens with us that uh, uh, that uh, we lost the connection but if your uh, cache memory is high we can store the data in the cache so duo drone is also using this cache of the drones the cache memory of the computer is very very important for future generation seamless connectivity okay so cache memory is playing a major memory, uh, important things so when you want to buy a laptop or any kind of mobile device you have to think you have to ask what is your cache memory 90% of people do not ask what is cache so dual computing is only possible due to this cache memory if the cache memory is high your system your mobile will work or your drones will work without internet for even for 4 5 minutes okay maybe for 2 3 minutes they can store the data in the cache as if there is no loss in the internet connectivity clear yeah? let us come to the our today's topic called uh, drone security so drone is very important for uh, all the applications i have mentioned starting from uh, agriculture infrastructure healthcare mining industries everywhere right when drones are flying drones are nothing but flying computer do you agree anyone Do you agree with me that drones are nothing but flying computer? Yes. Yes, sir. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Agreed, so, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So you know that if your computer, you know, computers can be hacked, right? Agree or disagree? Your your computers are hacked, right? Nowadays, so lots of hacking is happening, ethical hacking, hacking, whatever. So if your if a computer can be hacked, why not the drones will be hacked? Drones are also hacked. Hundreds of drones are flying. They can be also hacked. Because drones are also nothing but flying computer. Even your mobile phone is also computer. It has a screen, it has a memory, it has also processing power, it has also keyboard in it, your laptop, you know, everything. You know, it is computing power, right? So drones is a lot of computing power, it can be also hacked. It is also susceptible to cyber attack. And lots of cyber attacks are happening nowadays. Right? So attackers may misuse or manipulate the sensors or the input or the functions of the drones, right? Because drone has also the embedded computational systems. Hackers can disable them to use for denial of service or for information corruption. They can corrupt the information, wrong information they can provide. Now, what is our requirement? We have to go for cyber air worthiness, safety. It means we have to provide the safety for this, uh, these drones. Also for cyber reliability. Cyber reliability. We have, you know, drones must be reliable in nature to provide the security, right? So the people are, you know, uh, building the drones like a bird and tested like a tank. You know that lot of military applications are happening in extreme conditions. Even India, you cannot believe it, thousands of drone making companies are there. But not in that in great level, but slowly, but uh, at least, you know, that a lot of uh, budding entrepreneurs Many of them are working in this uh, drone safety and security. 
so it is a very very important topic that drone cyber security is very very important topic and especially for military applications so minus 22 uh, plus 50 degree centigrade the drones can operate and many 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 applications are there this is one of the company indian company i took it from their site built like a bird and tested like a tank tank means military tank very interesting term they have used Built like bird means it has all kind of intelligence it is all kind of autonomous features all kind of computing capabilities like a bird and so light like a bird at the same time tested like tank like a military tank it can go for fighting with other countries and also take care of the border security so what are the defense applications see uh, drones can act as a you know virus coronavirus and lot of drones applications are there anti terror activities every day india is you know susceptible to this drone attack every day if you go to last week newspaper even yesterday also there are a lot of attacks are there in kashmir area and other areas border border security counter insurgency crime control in your uh, you know municipal areas or anywhere crowd sensing crowd monitoring disaster management in the either earthquake or any kinds of uh, tsunami disaster management drones are used wildfire monitoring traffic monitoring so there are a huge amount of applications there for this uh, safety and security now this gps jamming is very very common and it's happened in 2011 okay what is that uh, engineer is responsible for interception managed to hack the gps navigation because navigation is weak so by putting a jammer jamming means uh, noise on communication you can force to this bird into what bird means the drones into autopilot means you can capture the data so then the bird will lose its brain very interesting word why the bird will lose lose its loses its brain brain means it can loses its control means what it means very simple you know that uh, this is our base stations these are drones and we are getting the gps location means uh, latitude longitude and uh, for civilian man there is no encryption no authentication weak signals are there very simply an intruder can come with better signal higher signal compared to gps they can give you the fake uh, fake uh, latitude longitude and they can take control of this uh, this drones so this is called drone jamming okay another thing is the interception where the, the, uh, the controller is there see this is the intruder the hacker this is the controller in normal case listening to the signals of what is the signal is used by this one this person say so it is you or me right i am using this drone so the hacker drone is also flying very close to this drone and they can listen to the weak signals weak wireless signal and what will happen first you will it will de authenticate the controller of your average person then it will take the charge it will make it authenticate as if this drone is connecting to this controller but this controller loses its control over the system so you know this is a you know this this drone is authenticating themselves with this one so by this way they can control the system using this one right so this is a normal case and uh, if you're using if you're an amateur drone uh, user then any controller can happen you know this kind of things can happen right so this is called sky hijack so drones flying on the ground weak signals are there forcefully we can disconnect the wireless connection of the true owner of the target drone then authenticates with the target drones by penetrating to the owners then feeds the commands that means this drone will listen to the command of this intruder so it will move to the direction where this controller wants means the hacker wants so this code is available this person who made this raspberry pi hacking on this code called skyjack this this codes are also available this is a website link www samy.pl skyjack anyone is interested please go through this website you can see what kind of things there he made 
it's called hijack sky jacking so you can do this experiment of your own in your college or if your university you have uh, multiple drones you can start uh, this kind of hacking systems or anti hacking if you start hacking then we can develop the anti hacking systems okay another one is a middle uh, man in the middle attack very old kind of attack where actually uh, we are modifying the communication and inject new communication and the medical this is very important that modifying the communication inject new information also delete the communication right what is that this uh, mim mitm this is maybe another drone or another computer it comes in between and uh, the pilot loses connection this drone will be controlled by this one this uh, mitm mitm right man in the middle attack so this is very interesting uh, area of uh, drone attack of mitm now question is uh, can the drones can fly to any area is it allowed in the airport area can anyone say no sir it is military, military area, area. Yeah. yeah yeah if you go to the uh, government of india website i think i have seen today's divash uh, chatterjee is coming right today's evening He is expert in cyber law. Yes, sir. So he is expert in cyber law. He is very good cyber lawyer. So you can get the cyber laws are there for drones, right? You can ask him. He can give you more detailed information for recent cyber laws. So suppose uh, now the question is, uh, my house I stay at Domdom, very close to airport. Almost every hour uh, flights are going uh, above my uh, house, right? so if i want to fly the drones my drone can uh, you know that you know they can uh, collide with the uh, flights right now what is the solution solution is uh, if you want to fly the drones your drones will not fly to certain area height because there is a lakshman rekha you know lakshman rekha anyone know this sita this is avan right yes yes sir yes. i thought i should give this picture which is analogous to this our drone area right there is some lakshman rekha lakshman rekha is also uh, available for um, uh, cockroach right yes i think many of us use it lakshman rekha so that cockroach will not come to that area right similarly lakshman you know in uh, ramayana you know that ravan uh, is to come it means the drone want to enter to the zone but his gps is disabled you know the drone cannot area enter to that uh, area means if sita remains within the uh, within his boundary then uh, uh, you know that no one can hack right so this is the concept of uh, geo fencing we call it geo fencing right geo fencing is very very interesting research area listen those who are interested in uh, this uh, drone security area geo fencing is another very interesting area uh, of research also in cyber law is lot of laws are there how to develop these drones and these laws are different from country to country us has different law and india laws are different okay what is geofencing geofencing is a software program that uses the global positioning system or rfid to define the geographical boundaries so your your software you have to install in your system in your system means in your drones there are some gps location where you will not be allowed drone will come but they will not be able to enter because this way lakshman rekha that means gps location they cannot enter right even they can go to certain height if you are staying near the airport there is some auto software updates you know you have to update the software otherwise you have to go to jail there is some cyber laws are there i can i think you can ask it to uh, mr vivash because he will give uh, details of it what is the cyber laws for this uh, geo fencing for this uh, autopilot drones right so he is expert and lot of laws are coming up because huge amount of accidents are there right and sometimes for if you are staying if your location is near the airport even you will not be able to buy the drones so a lot of uh, limitations are there right so this is a geo fencing no flying zones we will not be able to proceed to that area see not able to proceed to the, that zone 
and that has been inbuilt in the software or in the you know gps location your signal will be disabled right there is some jamming kind of things are happening either two way it is possible the airport can jam by themselves or the the drone knows this is the zone we cannot move okay two way it is possible both way it is possible so this is the green zone and red zone by this way we actually we are defining the zone so drones we cannot send to infinite long distance so like switzerland says more than beyond 4 km you cannot fly a drone every country has different uh, drone flying uh, norms and regulations are there right so we cannot uh, go to certain us uh, norms are also different right now another thing is very important popular is called anti drone if some drones are coming intruder and if the airport authority finds that okay someone is coming with the bombs and everything they can use this jamming system jamming system jammer is very common right jamming is jammer is nothing but a powerful uh, communication system powerful signals and also provide the security to the drones right so that uh, there is a radar always you know checking the uh, system tracking and at the same time you know that they will not allow anyone to come to this area uh, there is some uh, interesting videos i have seen in youtube let me share just if you give me time i can share the just a minute so anti drones are very popular and uh, many countries uh, are using it in the border area even india also using this anti drone to hack down or track down the you know the military you know the in the military zones so lot of hacking is happening so if they come to our country and they can affect our whole system You might not know what SSL is, but hackers do, and they hate it. Which is why you need it. It's like having a bodyguard for every piece of data on your site. Get the strongest encryption on the market with okay, SSL. The screen is not visible. Yeah, I, I have not started. Yeah, okay, okay, sir. Just see this video. It is on the YouTube. So this bird has been tracked. One bird has been tracked, and it's a simple bird. So it is showing birds, right? Now an attacker drone is coming with a bomb. Now see, is video tracking started? Detecting the drone and video tracking started. see uh, just see this video so this drone is coming and uh, this is uh, called operator pellingation means it can understand who is the operator this drone place area shows uh, this is the operator right 
he is operating this drone from this ground station so using this you know pelingation is called array tracking and drone pelingation so it is tracking from where this drone is coming that is the source and destination now you have to use the jamming system activation so this is the anti drone jamming system so it is uh, providing high frequency and high power signals so that drone cannot move even move because it has been jammed last is the drone catcher system we have to catch the drone we cannot destroy because uh, then there will be a blast and see the drone operators will be also arrested the drone operator will be arrested from this yellow area right we can understand what is the source and by this way we can uh you know hack the whole system track the whole system and after getting the drone in your room in in the forensic lab they can understand what is kind of drones what kind of security who is the what is the target and what kind of you know any kind of information we can get it from the drones right so this is a very interesting uh, small video actually this is called anti drone anti drone okay so it is detecting first then jamming then camera unit is there is capturing the what is actually happening Yesterday, uh, while I was preparing that, that see, India is also buying 300 uh, crore rupees dollar, crore rupees not rupees dollar drones for their border security. The today is actually last yesterday night newspaper, very popular Bengali newspaper, right? So, so you know that every country is now understanding that drones are very popular and uh, drones are actually. you know that uh, he, uh, less human uh, loss right casualty is less human casualty is less so we are buying these drones for safety and security for our citizens now the question is uh, forensic of drone is another very interesting area not only you have to capture the drones you have to do the forensic means while you are collecting the data from the internet of drones you have to do the mapping and uh, actually we call it internet of insecure things right so because everything is under attack so what are the types of attack first is the taking control then is the stealing the information and third type of attack is disrupt the service so when the drones are coming they have to take the control i have shown you that uh, de authentication authentication technique stealing the information they can steal the information from as an intruder and also disrupt the services so there are various interesting areas of uh, attacks so drone forensic is very important to understand the motive of the attack they can understand the which country is attacking and what are the, who is the attacker what is the model and everything so drone forensic is very interesting area and uh, last year cedac uh, kerala they have started their uh, kerala also started their forensic laboratory last year august almost one year before this forensic laboratory is actually helping uh, to understand the features of the drone so there are a lot of applications are there uh, that means uh, open source softwares are there to understand the drones so drone forensic is a new technology taking the industry to training class utilizing the latest digital forensic softwares so a lot of companies are developing uh, this uh, system so earlier we have to find out the crash data crash data means if you gun down a drone there will uh, drone will crash 
in the pig figure in the video you have seen you have to catch the drone but some uh, many times uh, catching drone is not possible so you have to gun down the drone you have to uh, capture the crash data from the crash data we have to go for flight data information gps coordinates flight tracking waypoints video pictures sensor logs operating system ground control system data mobile phone data uploading or how much data is already given to the enemy that we also can be tracked how much data is already gone from say our country to other country that can also can be tracked using these mobile edge devices or cloud data also social media we can get scan this system lastly the launch point launch point means where the drones are launched or what is the name of the drone what is the serial number there is a make by this way you can get the information actually drone forensic is very important to understand the safety and security of our country even why it is important why forensic is important because if we have this information they can we can file a case against that country i think uh, bivas uh, will come that any ask him that uh, bivas challenge that how we can proceed this these are very important forensic tools are very important to file a case against certain country so we have to know we have to get all this kind of information forensic information to file the case okay first step is that you have to uh, document the devices you have to get the data from the drones identifying the data storage that means sd cards or the memory devices or rams or roms then you have to go for investigation of uh, the ics integrated service circuits which is available on the drones okay so suppose uh, this is a drone gunned down in the border area by our military armies and uh, see already some part is affected so some part we have to rebuild for rebuild means say this part has been affected we have to rebuild some part to activate to get the data from the from this drone part right as much as possible so you know we have to get the digital evidence we have to establish the ownership of the data using the fingerprint or dna evidences which is non forensic kind of thing but yes we have to get this information then we have to go for the uh, sd cards qr codes other things you know various other mac models payloads uh, ip address ip address uh, will help you to understand which country actually is attacking your uh, your borders or areas right so from the crash data we have to do the scissor you know when you go for any uh, casualty areas or drone uh, Cash areas. We have to go for the scissor. We have to take the image. We have to go for the acquisition of data. Then we have to go for analysis of data. We have to reconstruct the whole event. We have to provide the facts, outline the events, and outline the methodology. That means the reporting. Then the lawyers can file the case after reporting, right? So these are the three steps: acquisition, analysis, and reporting. So these are the very basic three steps of uh, drone forensics, right? first and foremost is a gps coordinates which will help you to understand how you are connecting which edges of the clouds and uh, what are the locations uh, there are uh, some of the drones like edge drone is using this android operating system now android operating system is easily to we can hack it or we can extract the information <laughs> we have that uh, forensic tool and there are various softwares are there to understand these features right see what is the voltage current latitude longitude This uh, real data. We, I get it from this paper, uh, 2019, for forensic validity analysis towards technical investigation process. So, Sensor Journal it is published. So you can see this is the <coughs> time and the coordinates. This is the voltage, current of the drones, and all this. So these are the flight logs. You know that. any flight is flying whether it is a airport aircraft or is a helicopter or drone these are the information actually we gather from the system and this is the elevation and the flight activity which height it is going and what are the records when when it is coming down or going height you know this is the these are the features that are available right 
we all get this information from these case studies, right? Uh, one of the case study we did with DJI Phantom 3. This is one of the Chinese drone, uh, drone which is uh, very popular uh, in all over the world. And uh, there are some of the softwares called NCASE version 7.12.2. These are the, some of the open source softwares that is uh, freely available. Those who are interested in this research, they can uh, simply go through this uh, NCASE software or DATCON software. They provide the information. You know that uh, when a flight uh, crashes, how you get the information? Anyone can say? Black box. Yes, black box. They use DATCON or NCASE software to extract the information. What is the main reason, actual reason of this crash? What is the exact, uh, whether it's a fault of the pilot, whether it's a fault of the aircraft, or any other reason. So, so this will give the, those are the experts in the domain. So they, they get this information and various uh, you know results. Uh, we are getting models, video capture, audio capture, yes, no, yes, no. This indicates that uh, the software gives this information. What is the height, measurements, everything, details. I'm not going in detail because we can take another three, four hours to discuss. But uh, just I want to show you that we can actually analyze the ICs and understand the various information from the drones. And this is the .bat file. The .bat file, we can get it. Either by Windows or by Linux, uh, we can uh, get the information from the drones itself. So this is uh, one of the step of dot, uh, datcon.2.4 for flight log. OK. Also, it can add flight trace waypoint. Waypoint means which uh, waypoint means the flight path, which path the flight has been coming from the sky. So everything can be uh, tracked down. Okay. Storage, I have already mentioned that SD cards are very popular to get the storage. And a lot of papers are available for drone forensics. Those who are interested, they can go for Journal of Digital Forensics, Security is a law. See, law and law. Law is very important. Forensic and law is also related. You can ask to Viva said that how this law is related to forensics. So, so exact and accurate data capturing and data extraction from the drones are very, very essential to establish the law. So it will help the lawyers to, uh, to fight the case against, against other countries. To establish the, in different uh, forums like UNESCO and uh, other forums to, to fight against the country that who is doing the terrorism, and we can provide this evidence from this digital forensics, right? So these are some of the actual uh, results from the case studies. Uh, storing the data from the file. So what are the steps of forensics? Preparation, identification, category, measurement of weight. What is the weight of the drones? Check the customization, fingerprints of the, of the owner. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth connectivities, memory, geospatial locations, Bluetooth, and forensic report. So these are the 11 steps. So I'm not going to all the steps, but just I'm going through the slides, preparation, identification, class or category, measurement of weight, checking of customization, fingerprints, fingerprint for uh, non-forensic is a biometric kind of thing. Bluetooth, we should not, uh, you know, the drones must use their own network. If the hackers are coming, you know, the multiple networks are around us. So it is uh, very difficult for the drones to select and reject the drones. So people are using this blockchain technology to uh, make your drone safe and secure. Otherwise, they would be going to the trap, right? Memory cards, yes, one of the very important evidence. I think most important evidence is the memory card in the forensic uh, tool applications. Two locations for the drones. We can understand which country the drones have started based on the latitude and longitude of the drones. A forensic report writing is another important art. And this is done by the lawyers. So I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know the details of it. But forensic report writing is another very interesting. And uh, the laws are there, how to write the reports and all these things. So, so these are the very, very interesting area of uh, research that uh, digital forensics for drone computing. For the drones, for forensic, we have MAC address model information and functions for owner, type of owner, profile of the owner, and preference of the owners. 
Part first means takeoff, flight, and landing. These are the information. Services means camera, GPS sensors. Environment means in location information, timing, and event. So this is the ontology or taxology, uh, taxonomy for this uh, drone computing. How this uh, drone forensic actually happens. Uh, the forensic tool are used for this uh, cyber forensics for this drone log data. So these are the, some of the data I'm uh, not going into details, but just operating system forensics. Yes, uh, sometimes Linux is. And anyone know Kali Linux? Kali Linux. Anyone know about Kali Linux? Yeah, yes, about yes, I have heard yes. this name yeah. and Pinterest and testing. Kali Linux yeah. and Pinterest. So in our university Macau, we give training on Kali Linux. We have a center for this uh, training for operating system. Kali Linux is uh, one, uh, very important for forensic analysis, OK? Especially for this investigation. Those who are interested for this forensic or cyber security, they must use uh, this Linux and Kali Linux, which is very important for this forensic applications to extract the information so uh, one of our teachers says that if you hate uh, kali na lagle shikhte parbe na you understand what i said you have to use kali linux to understand the philosophy of forensics this lecture is not enough i have just given lecture of two hours you will forget after some time but if you use this kali linux you can understand how to extract the information from a uh, forensic site how to do the investigations and these investigations will help our lawyers to file the case, right? So I'm not going in detail of it. I have to finish. I think time is over, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, any question from the participants? Uh, yes, I do have. Yes, yes. OK. Uh, OK, so sir, thank you so much for these informations. And uh, this is really, really helpful. So just wanted to know a few things. Um, so actually, we are we need to concentrate about the data at rest and data at motion and uh, integrating with the IoT security and cloud security. Is it? Uh, yes, yes, correct. OK. So application security also we are using, right? Uh, the, the application which we are using to control the drone. Exactly. So your app must be secure app. Otherwise, you know, other, will, <laughs> other people will come and hack it. So that is the you know, blockchain I've said about drone chain. Mm -hmm. Drone chain will become uh, popular. You know, drone with blockchain is one of the popular uh, kind of things that are happening. You know, lightweight mm -hmm. blockchain is used for this because blockchain is heavy. So mm -hmm. uh, we cannot use a power power hungry algorithm. So mm -hmm. IoT based uh, lightweight blockchain we are using for this one application. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, one more. So, so that is for dew drone. Uh, if you told like for catch memory, it will be storing some data and it will be um, helpful when internet is not there yes, yes. so in that case uh, like is it like is it like we can bypass the payment gateway uh, using that catch memory uh, not uh, not like that catch memory is used for actually uh, even internet is gone right suppose yeah. internet is gone yeah internet is not there so not there. Is, yeah. if you have cache memory you know it can store your data for some time for 2 3 minutes yeah, yeah. Like, suppose, can we make any data like, like payment gateway? Can we bypass pay payment gateway? It's uh, not. It's not bypassing the payment gateway. Is basically, <laughs> uh, if your temporary internet connection is gone, uh, you can use this uh, uh, dew dew computing means uh, dew computing for seamless connectivity. This connection connectivity will be as if it will be on, like on, because okay. cache will cache will connect, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And you, you know, will be happy to know that we are writing on. I'm also working in the group. If you're interested, you can. Uh, it's my mobile number, so you can contact us. We are, yeah. working, we are working in the details of this uh, this uh, dew computing standardization. Okay, so right. uh, you'll be happy to know that I'm working the team for IEEE uh, standardization for dew computing. Okay. Oh, great. So I'm also vice chairman of this uh, this committee. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, I was, uh, we are writing also one book on dew computing so that everyone can understand the philosophy mm -hmm. of it. So dew computing is basically minimizing the dependency of internet. OK. I can give you one example. If you permit, time permits, I can say, if you use, uh, say, uh, Dropbox. Do you, have you used Dropbox? Yes. 
what is the purpose of dropbox storing store, data storing data yeah. offline you can store it offline hmm. yes but when internet will be coming then the data will be going to the internet exactly so your dropbox is one of the example of view computing all right uh, same like yeah 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 similar uh, all right oh uh, one more question i have um suppose you have 50 drones okay yeah. and i as an attacker i create a drone with the same tracking id or maybe the ip address are the same for ip spoofing yeah and i wanted to connect with your system so um like if you like how are you validating from your system that you are connecting to the legitimate drone yeah see see uh, you know that uh, there are some mm -hmm. protocols are there first of all authentication protocols are there so uh, using the mm -hmm. authentication protocol we can do it uh, i i mentioned about the hashing if the hash mm -hmm. value do not match then the drones cannot be allowed to enter the intruder drone will not be allowed if the hash value do not match that is the basic principle of blockchain right okay 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 you so, know uh, to make it protected uh, this drone protected blockchain is very important essential yes okay so that will uh, keep your this malicious drones or malicious nodes mm -hmm. apart from the system all right all right so may i know the auth mechanism that is being used from user to drone as well as drone to drone authentications like the mpty is uh, one of the very popular uh, protocols which is used for this drone to drone publisher subscriber model i've discussed so, on ldap or which one uh, sorry mqtt mqtt okay protocol M M okay okay that one yeah 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 This is a huge topic. We so know, message uh, queue, what yeah, mentioned, yeah, right? Yeah. Message queue. Yeah. yeah, yeah, message queuing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is called MQTT, message queuing telemetric transport protocol. Okay, that takes care of the authentication mechanism. Yes, 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 yes. All right. Thank you so much. So these are the queries actually. Yeah, yeah. You are from which, which college? Actually, uh, I'm a ethical hacker, certified ethical hacker, working with Honeywell Aerospace for okay, last. Great. Yeah. So I'm always keen about learning. I was into uh, uh, like academic profession for long. So after that, I moved to uh, this profession. So great to know that so many things are uh, happening. And so you're based on Bangalore, Bangalore. Yeah, yeah. I, I was into US recently. Moved to uh, Bangalore. You which company? Honeywell, right? You mentioned Honeywell Aerospace. Okay, great, great. Yeah. yeah. So we can that... keep in touch. No problem. I can give you yeah. share more information to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Yeah. What is your name? You mentioned your name. M my name is Rahul Majumdar. Rahul Majumdar. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to know that in, from industry also you are joining. You are taking. Yeah, I'll, I'll always keen to learn. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Okay. Any question from others? Anyone? Okay then. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for enriching us with such a valuable session. Our participants will surely improve themselves uh, from the knowledge they gather in this discussion, Doman, for this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Very. Thank you. Thank you, Devashish, sir. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, followed by a great start with our first session uh, this online on this online five days faculty development program on advancement of uh, cyber security technically sponsored by ieee kolkata section we will now move forward to our second session for the day which is on how to hide information by professor dr joydeep havladar dr joydeep havladar is currently an assistant professor at the department of computer science and engineering of nit durgapur Dr. Jody Bhavlada has done his B.Tech from Kolani Government Engineering College, West Bengal, India, in this year of 2001, and M.Tech from NIT Durgapur in the year of 2009. He has received his Ph.D. in NIT Durgapur in Electronics and Communication Engineering in 2017. His research interest is in the field of cryptography, information security, theory of computation, randomized algorithm, etc. He has published his various work in different prestigious journals like Springer, SEM, etc., along with many other conference publications. Dr. Havlada has given invited lecture in different workshop and FDPs, and also organized different techube sponsored workshop 
and been part of government funded projects on information security education and awareness as well now may i please request dr joydeep havlada sir to continue sir thank you thank you thank you yes good morning all of you so we have a, a great participation there are more than 50 participants we are having so in this uh, session uh, i will try to make a brief uh, Uh, brief introduction, or uh, not not like an introduction. I'll I'll present some uh, some events or historical instances how the uh, how the information uh, security or the how how messages can be transferred from one side to another side in a secure way. Uh, let me present my screen. So is it visible? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. So let me start our journey. So it, this uh, presentation is basically a journey uh, from from some uh, from the age of ancient age to how we have developed our systems such that we can uh, communicate in a secure way. So uh, what you can understand that. hiding is basically a uh, basic instinct uh, there are different organisms like uh, unlike uh, human being there are other organizations they also use some mechanisms or so they have developed some techniques to hide some uh, some things uh, in this case uh, if we uh, if we consider the uh, camouflage camouflage is basically a property or you or you animal develop these properties to hide themselves uh, from the uh, predators Similarly, the other take, other uh, things are something like this. Shell, shell. They have developed some uh, shield to hide themselves. Similarly, uh, this animal uh, they have developed some orders. Means when they are uh, they are uh, they are in a danger, they uh, spread some bad orders such that they can uh, protect themselves. Similarly, the other techniques are there or other mechanisms are developed by the organisms. So, uh, so mankind is not the difference. Mankind also develop different types of organisms to to make their themselves protected. Apart from that, mankind also have some some things which is called valuables. So we basically possess something which which is value. Uh, so we also try to hide or we also try to protect the valuable things. So the ancient times they used to, uh, or in the present times we also use some some types of uh, some types of mechanisms. Like we we assign some gatekeepers or we assign some lock and key to get our systems or to get our valuable things to be protected. Uh, and then the then the scenario changes when we move from uh, tangible items to the non tangible items, or we are moving from uh, from a virtual. virtual things like digital domain digital domain is basically a domain which is very much intangible in nature so i cannot i cannot uh, i cannot uh, i cannot put the digital content in a box and then i can save it okay so the digital content when moves from one uh, one machine to another machine or one system to another system they moves over a channel and these channels are basically uh, vulnerable so these channels uh, uh, does not protects the uh, message okay they are basically called the open channel so we'll try to understand what do we mean by the open channel but before that uh, the digital when we go for the digital uh, domain or when we are having non tangible items then how to hide these things or how to protect these things from uh, from un, uh, unauthorized access that is the main question so uh, the digital objects are basically these types of properties we are having they are non tangible but uh, that means i cannot hold it i cannot hold it in a uh, in in a box or in some in i cannot put it into lock and key but they are very much easy to attain uh, but, but the thing is that uh, i can get the digital content very easily if this is available in the uh, in the web i can easily get it or if this is available in a system or hard disk then uh, the hard disk can easily access so there are some mechanisms we can access the hard disk okay. and uh, and you can understand that uh, a disk contains uh, some size of memory means uh, say uh, 32 
32 GB of memory or even 1 TB of memory, then I cannot use, uh, uh, it is not a practical thing that I use a small information like my password or my name in a device and keep it into lock and key. So this device is basically used for for a huge number of storage and where i have to share or where the particular a small amount of memory has been shared for storing the uh, secure information and the other the other part of the memory is uh, shared for storing some other information yeah. so i cannot use uh, use tiny memory cells for uh, or independent memory cells for storing the information okay. so so this is called the attend. I can easily attend the information. So if it is in the web, I can easily attend these things. If it is in the system, I can also uh, attend these things very easily. Then they are easy to modify. The, this is this thing. The point number two is very, uh, very uh, crucial. The digital contents are very, very easy to modify. They can easy to replicate, and they they are easy to transmit. The thing, uh, the thing is that if we have a hard written document, then this document is uh, difficult to modify. We have to copy it, uh, then, or we have to copy in a different way to modify these things. But if it, if the things is a digital part, then I can easily modify the part, and we uh, there may not be any log of the modifications. I can delete the uh, log of the modifications. Then it is easy to replicate. Uh, what is the problem of replicating this thing? Say if say if we consider the digital signature as a as a handwritten signature like a pattern that you used to perform in the banks or in some uh, paper so if this thing is a uh, signature uh, which will be applied in the digital domain then everybody can copy and paste the uh, image or uh, the signature is appearing like an image uh, or a pattern so i can easily easily replicate the patterns of others and put it in some document and uh, claim that this is the document which is produced by something else like i can uh, somebody can scan my signature put on a check and claim these things that the check has been issued by me so uh, replication is a problem in the digital domain then it is also a problem for transmission the transmission is easy to do we have um, nowadays there is a huge uh, development in the network or data communication system then it is easy to transmit the uh, information from one end to another and transmission makes it vulnerable so the thing is that if the data is stored in a uh, system then we can apply some access control mechanism to protect the data but when the data is uh, is uh, transmitted from one machine to another machine or one system to another system then all the mechanisms which are used for protecting the data on a system is not applicable now the information is in the public domain and uh, and there there are different types of uh, attacks or different types of vulnerability exists okay. and uh, then information in, or message is valuable that uh, so you know what you know subsequent part we'll understand that uh, that what is valuable things valuable things is not only the tangible items so uh, information now becomes more valuable okay. and that can be understood in this way uh, so there are some instances there are some historical events which have which was noted uh, in the history the first historical event uh, is something uh, uh, during the during the uh, Vietnam War, uh, where, where there is there was a war between uh, U.S. government and the uh, Vietnam, and in that case, Vietnam uh, Vietnam has captured uh, Delton. Delton was a American politician. They he was he was under prison, under prison in the Vietnam. Yeah. And in a in a conference or in a uh, in a web conference, Vietnam produced this guy, and um, in a uh, in, in some TV conference, and this guy, this uh, Delton, he used to spell the word torture by blinking his eyes. Yeah, he blinks his eyes in a Morse code. Morse code is basically a code which is used for telegram communication. So uh, there are some uh, some uh, periods of intervals if, and he used to uh, blink his eyes using that period of in period of uh, instances and he spelled the word torture and this uh, this video or this uh, tv or tv program uh, was transmitted in the us uh, us part and the uh, navy us navy the intelligent uh, intelligent department of the U.S. Navy, they understood that uh, this Delton uh, has spelled the word uh, torture by blinking his eyes. Okay. 
thing and then uh, they need that okay the, all the prisoners in the vietnam they are being tortured by the uh, vietnam government so this is basically uh, information which has been part of the uh, a small um, small things but this is very uh, very crucial in the history of vietnam war so uh, he used to blink his eyes uh, with the moss foot to spell the word torture which has uh, which has understood by the uh, intelligent uh, uh, intelligent part of the uh, us navy and they uh, they noted these things okay. so uh, so this is one type of information which is uh, unaware by the vietnam uh, vietnam that the person is standing uh, sitting in uh, in front of the tv and he is uh, talking some things and also he is sending some message to the another side so there is another example in the uh, during the world war 2 uh, world war 2 the german spy, spy he wrote a letter which looks to be innocent so this this letter this statement is looking to be innocent but if we take the second alphabet from this word then there is another message which which is basically uh, information to the german uh, german uh, uh, german military and he says that the navy the na the, there is a uh, troop the troop is leaving uh, from new york on Jan july 1 so this is the information he is sending to uh, to the german military okay but what he is wrote is basically looks innocent but inside this innocent uh, statement there was this, there was a uh, secret information so uh, and then uh, even this these two events are basically one event is in the Vietnam War, then the second event is in the World War II. And in the World War One, in the first World War, World War uh, the, uh, there is a doctor who is working for the US, uh, Benjamin uh, Churchill, and he used to write some encrypted messages to the uh, British. Means, uh, at the time, it was the British, uh, British General Thomas Gard. And in this letter, he wrote, wrote the letter by making a substitution. Like A is written by, by something a triangle, B is written something a, uh, something a figure, and every alphabet is written some uh, different figures. And then he sent these things to the uh, US, uh, to the uh, British uh, general. And British general uh, retranslate their things and get, used to get the message. And this is the, if you search in the uh, Google about the letter of the Benjamin, you'll find, uh, find out some instances, find the history of this thing. So Benjamin was, uh, prime, uh, eventually Benjamin was captured by the uh, US and then he was interrogated. And he, he also uh, admit that he was, he was writing some secret messages to the uh, US, but he denied to translate the message. Yeah, after that, uh, after that, the intelligence of the US they finally able to decrypt the message, and when why they will they, what is the uh, scenario means why they are able to decrypt the message that will come in, in the later part, and in, again there is a there is instance uh, for the World War Two, there is a German uh, doll seller he was basically a uh, doll seller and he used to sell the dolls with a letter. Uh, to this customer, so the customers are basically uh, the uh, intelligence of intelligence of the uh, of the uh, Japanese, and he used to sell the dolls uh, with a letter. And in this letter, uh, he used to write something, and uh, with the intention that the word doll is replaced by the warship. Warship means the uh, navy, uh, the U.S. navy. So he used to send the information of the movement of the U.S. Navy by writing a letter to the uh, Japanese fights. Okay. So these are some uh, some things where the information plays a valuable role. So nowadays, the information is basically uh, basically a part of our lives. So we, we want to save our uh, accounts or bank accounts by some password. We want to save our uh, email accounts with some password. Everything is something like that. Okay. So now, uh, now we'll try to understand that how informations are basically secure. Means how we can make a secure communications from one side to another side. So the uh, so in the 
in the techniques, if we look into the techniques, there are two types of techniques are available. One is called the cryptography, and another is the steganography. Okay. The two mechanisms, uh, the cryptography is bas is basically a translation. So there is there are two party. One is the sender, and another is the receiver. And sender he performs some transformations of the message, and send that transform message to the receiver side. And receiver makes a reverse transformations of the message, and and uh, and the transform message means what is in the in the channel. This channel is open to all, so every adversary is able to read the channel. So he is able to see the channel. He is able to uh, read what is the message is going on. But as there is a transformations, the adversary is unable to understand what is what is speaking on the channel. So the only things sender can. Uh, Make a transformations and receiver can make the reverse transformation. So, and adversary uh, he is unable to make the reverse of the transformation. Okay. So this is called a uh, cryptographic algorithm. Uh, we will try to understand that uh, how this transformation can be performed. <clears throat> so keep in mind that the algorithm or the uh, function that makes the transformation is not the secret. The algorithm is basically a private. So what makes the things to be secure? There are some randomness which is used by the sender and the receiver. This randomness makes the things to be secure. Like simple example is uh, like the lock and key. So if I want to make my uh, message to be secure, I put this message in a box, then I put a lock and I send the box to the receiver. Okay? And receiver will have a copy of this of the key and he can open the lock and get the message okay so this is the this is sometimes uh, something anonymous to this part or analogy of this part so the thing is that something like this this uh, what is the public thing public thing is that everybody knows how the lock works everybody knows how what is the function of the lock what is the uh, mechanisms of the lock there are seven or there are six levers there are some um, uh, key which is having the uh, the key the teeth of the key having some combinations and if we uh, rotate the lock uh, key uh, in a right side it opens or it locks so this algorithm is known to everybody so the function of the lock the function of the key is not the secret what is the secret part the secret part is basically the combination of the key so every every uh, lock is having a particular combination and without that combination you cannot open the lock so the so cryptography is basically an algorithm which works like a lock and key. The, uh, the function of the lock and, or the function of the key is not the secret, but the randomness is the secret. Randomness implies that what is the combination of the lock, what is the, uh, how do the locks look like. Every lock, every key is different from others. So how the key looks like, that is basically the randomness. And this randomness is only, only known to the to the uh, sender and this randomness is also caused by the receiver and without this randomness nobody is able to open the message and the second thing is that uh, the uh, steganography. steganography is basically an, another part of the scenario here the algorithm is the secret so i have a secret mechanism to hide my information and this secret mechanism is known uh, by the receiver and then I can communicate the message. So adversary who looks into the media is unable to get anything from the media. And another part is important that the media is is a uh, innocent media. It means what the information which is embedded into the uh, into the media it looks like an innocent thing. Like if you look into the previous example. So this statement looks like an innocent thing. But uh, at the same time, if we if the secret secret algorithm is that you have to you have to embed the secret in the second alphabet of the lit words. So every words the second alphabet will imply a secret. Okay, and this information is known to the receiver side, and receiver can uh, retrieve the information. Okay, but uh, what is communicated over the medium is basically an innocent uh, innocent string or innocent uh, part. So adversary he will. Uh, unable to understand that something is uh, some secret information is uh, is carrying by the media. Okay, so this is the basic two difference, and the, this is the basic two uh, mechanisms to get make a secure communication. One one thing is that 
the first thing is cryptography where i have a public algorithm and i can use this public algorithm to make the uh, make the information secure or the make the transmission secure but uh, the transmission is not an innocent transmission the transmission implies that i have done some uh, transformations over the message and the receiver has to perform the reverse transformation over the message so on the other hand the steganography is a mechanism so that the algorithms are secrets the uh, the public pub, public does not know the algorithms how to embed and how to retrieve but the medium looks like an innocent medium okay. so these are basically uh, the uh, characteristics the um, Okay. Then another thing is that uh, how these things has, is happening. The first thing is cryptography. If we look into the cryptography, then cryptography medium does not allow any error. Means if there are some uh, some error into the into the transmissions, then receiver is unable to get the message. Say if if somebody uh, somebody modifies the transmission. Say I send a message in a crypt cryptic part. And somebody alters the message, or somebody alters some of the bits of the message, and then the receiver is unable to get the uh, correct uh, decryption. He will get a garbage of the part. On the other hand, the uh, steganography allows some uh, some par uh, permissible error into the medium. Like uh, like in this case, uh, say uh, I'll discuss this thing later. But uh, just a bit of this part. Say if I have an image, okay? so image. Uh, the there is a distribution of the colors, so the image is containing different distributions of the colors. And if uh, red color is little bit, uh, little bit uh, bright or little bit uh, dark, then it does not make any say, difference for the uh, for the interpretation of the perceptiveness of the eyes. So I cannot I cannot find the difference between two images where a particular red color is little bit darker or a little bit lighter. So uh, it looks little bit. It looks like an innocent of this part. So steganography is basically those mediums. It use those mediums which allow some errors in in the communication. Like there is a voice. There is a voice message. And then if their voice message is having little bit of change in the in the low frequency level, then the uh, the listener is unable to get what is the change in the uh, voice. Yeah. So uh, the medium which is allowing, which allows you to do some errors, or which allows you to, to ha have a permissible error range, and then this permissible error range is used for the steganography embedding of the secret. The second part is that there is a randomness that makes the decryption difficult. So uh, the definitions of the <coughs> or the hardness of the encryption is basically the definition of the randomness the size of the randomness as as long as the size of the randomness the decryption is uh, is uh, harder in this sense say something like this uh, say if we have a uh, key of uh, say six combinations then then you can use uh, to 10 to the power 6 like uh, if we just work it something like this say uh, okay let we have a key there is a key of say 10 digits here yeah. so what are the possible uh, means what is the size of these things what are the possible range of these things it, it range uh, 10 into 10 so there are 10 symbols or let it be um, say five digits so there will be 10 to the power 5 possible keys. So it runs from all 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to say 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. So these are the five digits and it runs from uh, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 99999. 9, 9, 9, 9. Yeah. And the key will be one of these things. So the probability of hitting a key is 1 by say 10 to the power 5. Okay. So, so as the key size is increased, so if I increase the key size from 5 to say uh, 8, then this probability is uh, is harder. Means the probability is now becomes 1 by 10 to the power 10 to the power 8. Okay. So, so the thing is something like this: uh, as the as we increase the key size, as we increase the randomness, the decryption is 
uh, is more hard. The steganography is basically uh, obs obscurity, means, uh, obscurity in the sense how we make the things, um, uh, how the secret is getting diffused into the media, means how it is, how, uh, how uh, uh, I cannot perceive the secret, that is the main thing. So my eyes is not able to perceive the secret, or my, uh, my uh, ear is not able to perceive the, the sound difference. So that is basically uh, the steganography. Okay. So whenever we talk about the cryptography part, then we are basically considering the two types of properties or two types of cryptography uh, techniques. One is the, called the computationally bounded and on this computationally unbounded. We will come to this part after some time. <laughs> and when we define the obscurity, then we have linguistic and the MBT. So linguistic, as we understand, this is basically the linguistic. So uh, Japanese, uh, the Japanese doll seller, he used to, uh, used to write some letter to his customer, uh, where uh, the customer, when the customer reads the letter and he tries to replace the word doll with the uh, American worship. And then he gets some information that, okay, the worship is, uh, is now moving or worship is under the maintenance, something like that. I will show you one example of this part. Okay. So this is the linguistic steganography. And another is the embedding steganography. Embedding steganography is that I am saying, so if there is an image, then at the image is basically uh, the distributions of the uh, colors and every colors is basically represented by a uh, gray scale. Yeah, so our red color is having a definition of the gray scale. Uh, RG uh, green is also having a definition of the gray scale in this way. So in general, the gray scale is uh, defined by the uh, eight bits and we have a bit planes. So eight bits means there are eight bits and the, uh, we have eight planes of the bits, something like this. Uh, so if we consider the blue color, then, then there is a blue color. And then we define the blue colors into the uh, bit planes. So there are eight bit planes. So this is the, called the least significant bit, and this is called the most significant bit. Okay. So now the thing is that if the uh, if the base value or its value is something one zero zero one zero one one zero, so there are four bits. There are four bits. Okay. So they basically it means that the most the most significant bit plane is containing one. The second most significant bit plane containing zero in this way, the least bits, least significant bit plane contains a zero. Okay. Now, now one can embed the secret information in the LSP part, in the lower bit plane. If I embed the secret information of bit one, uh, then the gray value will be changed something like this. So the blue gray value is changed from uh, this from this value to something like that. Okay. And my eye is unable to perceive the difference. So the difference between two gray values, which are the offset of one, uh, human eyes cannot uh, perceive this difference. So if I put a gray value uh, with with some different with some uh, gray with some gray value of something like this, if I put a blue blue color with a gray value of something like this, and if I put an another blue uh, color with a gray value of something like this, then my eye cannot perceive the difference. So, uh, so this is basically what is the error, per, you know, permissible error. So, one bit of permissible error is allowed. Even uh, in the research, it says that four bits of permissible errors are allowed. So, I can embed my the secret information in the lower bit plane, even in the second lower bit plane, or even in the third lower bit. Plane. So, the the last three bit planes can be used for embedding the secret, okay? because uh, the eye or the, my, my my human eye cannot find the difference between the <coughs> between the two gray values, which is having uh, the difference of uh, say uh, offset of eight or offset of seven. Okay, so uh, so these are the basic two techniques, and now we'll try to understand that how the techniques have been developed in the uh, throughout the years. So first, we try to understand that how the cryptographic techniques were developed. Okay. 
so cryptography is the subject which has which has been studied in the ancient age there are different types different instances of uh, using the cryptography like we have a caesar cipher uh, if we so if you go into the google or some books you'll find that there are some ancient mechanisms which are uh, called the caesar cipher or the greek ciphers which used to uh, which used to transform the message from uh, from one uh, one alphabet set to another alphabet set and something like this uh, if we if you look into the caesar cipher because this is a little bit of interesting part so caesar cipher is basically caesar which is, who is a roman uh, night he developed a disk something like this so in the disk uh, the outer part is labeled with a b c d the inner part is also labeled with a b c d something like this z and there will be a z but the inner disk can be rotated so i can i can make a rotation of the inner disk and then if, if we make a rotation of the inner disk it looks a b c something like this up to z and now a starts from uh, position of say d then a b c d e b will be appearing here in this okay and uh, the caesar will make a make a rotation of the inner disk and lock it and send it to his knight okay so now here is the caesar here is the caesar sender or we call these things as a caesar and here is the knight Okay. and both of them have a configuration of the caesar cipher okay so he also have a configuration of the caesar cipher now whenever caesar wants to send a message he used to replace uh, a with b b with e in so okay so uh, if i want to make a uh, message a and then he makes a transformations a will be transferred to uh, d and he sends d instead of a and is instead of a he sends d sorry he sends the d then knight also have the configuration and he will make the inverse of this part and in this way the uh, in adversary who is looking into the channel he has no idea about the message okay? but the problem is something like this caesar and caesar develop these things but uh, the problem is some something like how many such combinations are possible means how many how many different way i can encrypt the message so we have only 26 of alphabets and then caesar the disk can be can be fixed like a is pointing to a then uh, a is pointing to b or a is pointing to c in this way only there are 26 number of possibilities can be possible so a is either pointing with a <coughs> a is either pointing with b or a is either pointing with c so the caesar the caesar uh, the the device or the technique which is developed by the caesar he these te techniques can have only 26 possibilities so if i run uh, brute force by 26 some uh, 26 possibilities then i can able to decrypt the message in a uh, time but at, at the ancient days, these 26 possibilities were under were thought to be a difficult part. So, what is the another uh, scenario? Still, now we are using the same techniques in our modern cryptographic algorithms. We are using the same techniques, but instead of a, a substitution, it is called a substitution. We also have a, another mechanism, which is called the permutation. So. Present, present, um, or the modern cryptographic techniques, they are using the substitution with the permutation. So, in this case, what is what is happening? So, we are having the Caesar cipher, the same techniques. The outer block is written A, B, C, D, say E, and in the inner side, instead of a instead of having an order sequence of A, B, C, I have a permutation. Say P, X, Q, Z say a t something like this okay now the now the advantage or the uh the, what what is the advantage that we are getting so initially if we have the scissors cipher it is only having 26 possibilities now uh now if we look into the permutation then this permutation have 
26 factorial possibilities. Okay. And now, previously, the brute force attack is basically a permutation uh, a probability of 1 by 26. Now, the probability goes to uh, 1 by 26 factorial. Okay. So, if there is a brute force who wants to make a brute force of these things, then he have to search all the possible permutations with 26 alphabets. And then uh, there are there are 26 factorial number of possibilities and that number is uh, not a small number that number is a huge number okay. and brute force now becomes a difficult part to do okay so the so this is some test some uh, entire types of scenario but what is the what is the development which triggers the modern cryptographic, uh, cryptographic part is basically the communication system the first thing is that uh, if i don't have a uh, easy to communicate system easy to communication system then i uh, or if i want to write a message into a paper and send the message to somebody else then then uh, then the problem is or the security is basically depends on the carrier if i the, if the carrier reach to the power to the receiver side in a secure way then the message will be secure but now we are moving from the uh, from the handwritten message to an electronic message yeah, we are, we don't have the uh, handwritten message. So the development of the electronic message is uh, which starts from the uh, from the telegram systems. The telegram systems is basically a system where I want to communicate a message, but not in a in a uh, text written form. We have different types of signals like smoke signals, like light signals, black signals. They are used to communicate the message. Yeah. Uh, so initially. When we are moving from the from the uh, from communication techniques, then instead of writing text or instead of writing letters, uh, there are some another signals which can be easily communicated. So smoke signals can be easily communicated, light or flag signals they can be easily communicated. Okay. And then uh, the uh, the development is basically happens during the world war, uh, during the civil war of US. US times. So uh, before the World War One, there was a, another scenario which is called the Civil War of the uh, US. At that time, the telegram becomes a electronic communication. So I can I can uh, send a uh, send some message from one side to another side in an easy way uh, if there is a uh, connection, there is a wire connection between them. So uh, in the in the Civil War, war the America basically laid a uh, telephone te telegram lines. Uh, around say 15 miles so they basically connect uh, different regions of the uh, country using the uh, in, using some wire connections and uh, then they are they are able to communicate the messages okay after then after the telephone then the development was the radio communication the radio communication is basically a communication where i can speak i can speak some message and uh, that message can be transmitted over the uh, over the uh, land and it can be received to the another part so uh, so telegram to a, a speech communication uh, happens in 1901 and in the world war ii the military communication is basically the private communication of the radio so radio is is look like a broadcast media so if i speak something it will reach to the receiver side uh, very fine but the other party also able to listen the part so that is the main main problem. So the radio is basically radio is easy to intercept. So I cannot protect, protect my voice, or I cannot uh, make my voice as a secure communication. So what are the techniques they are using? They are using the code words. So instead of uh, instead of making some uh, commands, they are basically using the code words. Okay. So the code words are basically the offline encryption. They they, they have previous negotiation that speaking some uh, say uh, red wine so this is basically a code word for making an attack so they, they used to do these things in this world. then the change is happening at the world war ii at that time so what, what is happened there was a machine which was invented the machine is basically a, there are different types of machine which was invented the first one is called the enigma machine which was used by the german then there was uh, red and purple, purple machine, which were used by the uh, Japanese. Then M209 is the uh, France 
French machines. So these machines are like a typewriter. So they uh, they are basically having same types of structure. They are they have a typewriter of scenario. So when we when we uh, when we press some keys, the keys uh, give some signals. The signals are encrypted using some combinations of the uh, of some rotors, and then this this uh, signals is communicated over the telegram or the radio signals. So instead of speaking or instead of my voice, now it is basically a signal which is communicating from one side to another side, but the signal is generated by a typewriter. Yeah. Is the typewriter basically generates some uh, types. So it is written on a paper, but now the thing is that the paper is replaced by, the, by some electronic signals and these signals are communicated over the uh, channel. The channels are basically the radio channels. So, World War Two is is basically the change from the from the traditional messaging to a electronic message. So, I don't have uh, have text. I don't have voice. I don't have uh, light signals, smoke signals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I have electronic signals, and then these electronic signals can be encrypted, can be modulated, and they are transmitted from one side to the another side. So the World War II, uh, World War II uh, different types of machines were invented for the communications, and these machine, machines perform their job for secure communications. Uh, some, some, one of the best machine was the Enigma machine, which was uh, used by the German. And this Enigma machine is basically uh, having a history. So the thing is that uh, we find that the shift from <coughs> man to machine, man to machine in the sense, before the World War II, man are, uh, humans are involved in the encryption. So he have to, you have to perform the encryption as an offline process. Then you create the cipher, then you send the ciphers in a, uh, using some mechanisms, then decrypt, uh, receiver will receive the cipher, he will perform the decryption manual. So uh, they have code books or they have some, uh, some manual uh, booklets looking into the manual booklets, they have to perform the encryption and the decryption. But uh, machine replace all this manual activity. So man only type the message, uh, then that they are converted into electronic form, the, they are encrypted in the electronic form and they are transmitted. Okay. Then, uh, then there is, once the machine appears, then there is also a counter machines. So counter machines are the machines which are used for uh, for breaking the ciphers. So one machine is uh, creating the ciphers and other machines are used to breaking the ciphers because uh, because uh, during the World War II, these communications are basically uh, carrying the valuable things, uh, instructions to the uh, troops are basically the Enigma ciphers or uh, M209 ciphers, etc. Et yeah. <coughs> so, so that means this machine versus machines means one machine creates the cipher and another machine is used to break the ciphers. So this is this these mechanisms are or this practice is now uh, give the another area of the uh, part which is called the crypt analysis. Okay. So crypt analysis is basically uh, you have to design some algorithms and then this algorithm has to fit into a machine and then it tries to break the privacy of the system. Okay. So. So for the Enigma machine, if you look into the Enigma machine, so Enigma was used by the Germans, and uh, uh, and during the 1943, the first Enigma was break, broken by some uh, by some Polish mathematician, but he was unable to design the machine for deploying the uh, algorithm. Uh, so Alan Turing, who is who is basically a British or who is basically a British mathematician, he developed a Bombay machine to break the Enigma. So Enigma was the German uh, cipher and he, he deployed a machine which is called the Bombay machine which which is which was able to break the Enigma ciphers in five hours and that was in the 1945. So World War, is start, World War started in the 1941 before that Enigma was developed. Enigma was developed uh, as a commercial machine means it was not developed in the military uh, military area it was developed as a commercial machine in the sense that anybody can use this thing so the design of the enigma is known to everybody but the thing is that how the randomness which is used in the enigma is basically the secret part 
so british government also have a copy of the Edinburgh. he also british also get a, uh, get some enigma machines and they uh, instead of having uh, enigma machine they uh, or instead of having this enigma the bombay machine took around say three years to develop for breaking the enigma ciphers yeah. so in 1945 the bombay machine is able to uh, broke the enigma ciphers in uh, within five hours similarly there was another uh, parallel uh, parallel development was there in for the uh, u.s army uh, they used to broke the japanese uh, cipher japanese uh, where used the uh, red and purple machines they are similar line similar to the enigma machines and they are able to uh, break the purple or uh, red ciphers within six hours and that was in the 1942 so these so this um, so these are the basically the crypt analysis part so if i have a cryptographic algorithm then at the same time we also or the same time the adversary or the attackers develops the crypto, uh, crypto analyst, analytic algorithms and they these two are uh, the cryptography and the crypt analysis they are they are the rivals they are fighting each other to get uh, who will stand at the end okay so now the now the question is that uh, we, why those machines are weak means why uh, enigma was broken means what what is the uh, what is the theoretical uh, theoretical background that our system could be broken or the system is secure if we look into the um, theoretical part then uh, then there are the first things that we are trying to understand we have to understand the Karchov's principle the Karchov's principle says uh, let me check the Karchov's principle says that that uh, for the cryptographic algorithms, the algorithm should not be a secret part. So you, uh, it says that uh, the method that is used for the encryption and the method that is used for the decryption, that is not the secret. So the method should be public. Like Enigma, the design of the Enigma is public. So everybody knows how Enigma works. And it also says that uh, if if the if it goes to the enemy hands if the if the design is goes to the enemy hand then it does not cause any problem it should not cause any problem so if i give an enigma machine to the enemy even enemy is unable to uh, unable to uh, get my uh, message so like uh, it, it can be understood by a by a lock and key so you everybody knows if you everybody knows that how to how to prepare a lock so there are different companies like uh, link or something like this so godrej everybody knows how the how a, a lock performs yeah so so the design of the lock is common to everybody so i can also produce a lock but the thing is that what makes the thing secure that that the big the things that makes it secure is basically the combinations so how a lock will be opened or the how a lock will be closed that is a fixed combination of the teeth or uh, teeth of the key and if you don't have the proper combinations of the uh, key uh, key teeth then the lock cannot be performed so that is the main thing so what it was the principle says the also principle says that the algorithm or the method is not the secret okay That's, and even the method is known to the enemy he, he would unable to get any anything from out of it so that is the first principle that that we have to understand so i should not design any secret algorithm i should design a public algorithm okay and that public algorithm must have a randomness in my part uh, and that randomness will define the security of the system then uh, in the shannon secrecy that shannon secrecy says something different it says that uh, say the distributions of the message uh, means adversary knows the distribution of the message so uh, he, adversary knows that uh, sender may send send uh, say today today uh, at 10 o'clock we have to attack today at five o'clock we have to retrieve so this this vocabulary is known to the adversary today five o'clock ten o'clock attack retreat so something like this so this vocabulary, vocabulary is known to the adversary yeah and then uh, then it says that uh, after knowing the cipher if is equiprobable of 
of um, sorry after knowing uh, knowing the plain text uh, uh, knowing the plain text uh, after uh, sorry the thing is it says that if we if we know the plain text after the cipher is equivalent to uh, to not knowing the plain text uh, before the cipher it looks something like this uh, it says say say there is a adversary and there is a sender there is a receiver yeah so the first thing is that adversary he knows the cipher so this is the first game which where adversary knows the cipher okay and then he learns what is the message this is the message and then he learns the message okay and the second says that adversary adversary he does not have the message okay. so he only he does not learn the cipher text he does not learn the message and now the conditional probability the conditional probability says that knowing the cipher if he knows the cipher and he knows the cipher conditional to the message is equal probability this two probability is equal yeah so knowing the cipher without knowing the message and knowing the cipher uh, conditional to the message is equal equal probability so they they, they, are, they does not have any difference yeah that is that is the channel used to say the meaning of this thing is that cipher does not contain any information so uh, so knowing the plain text prior to the cipher or does not know the plain text uh, does not make any difference so your cipher does not contain any information about the plain text and the perfect security says that uh, knowing the two ciphers means I know uh, a list of ciphers. The perfect security says something like this: I know M1 and its cipher is C1. I know M2 and its cipher is C2. Now I have a, another cipher as C3. So this history, knowing the history of some previous cipher, does not give any hints to the M3. So I cannot find any any outcome of the M3. Okay. So, so perfect security says that if you know some past events of the cipher, that does not make any help in the decryption of a new cipher. So, and then there, uh, then we have two more concepts. One is called the diffusion and the confusion. So what is the diffusion? Diffusion says that the algorithm, the cryptographic algorithm should, should give you some uh, randomness and the measure of the randomness of the, uh, the measure of the randomness is basically the redundancy in the statistics so what is that what what does it mean it means that say if i am writing a uh, uh, english sentence okay, then i am basically using some alphabets a b c d etc etc and then this alphabet cp translate its ascii then they have some pattern say it it has a ascii of a this will have a ascii of b ascii of c and then we find that the distributions of the alphabets uh, or distributions of the uh, symbols like zero and ones in the ascii code they have a dis they have some statistics they have some redundancy like uh, a and b the more the uh, most significant seven bits are same only there is a difference into the least significant bits. So, so all the alphabets, if I write A followed by B, then I have seven bits which are common. Only there is a difference between the last significant bits. So these are the statistics, these are the redundancy. So uh, the diffusion will dissolve all this redundancy in the uh, in the cipher text. Okay? So your algorithm, your, your uh, uh, cryptographic algorithm should be able to diffuse all this redundancy in the cipher text. And the confusion is basically the relation between the key and the plain text. Okay. So, uh, so every time we have a uh, we have to apply some key, and this key will be amalgamated with the message. Understand? And uh, the confusion says that uh, the the relationship between the key and the message should be as complex as possible. 
So we have a com complex relationship between the key and the uh, message. So these are the properties. Now, another thing, Enigma, Enigma is basically uh, having some problems. The problem is that uh, there are there are some. If we con if we look into the configuration of the Enigma, Enigma is basically a, a substitution which only applies the alphabets. So it takes twenty six number of alphabets and it has a permutations of the alphabets. Yeah. And there there are some some rotors. Rotors are basically a gears. So in the in the morning the military has to configure the rotors. And say hey, he has to rotate the. Uh, there are three rotors. There are three gears in the systems, and they have to configure the three gears, put it into the machine, and then they execute the uh, encryption and the decryption. Okay, and then we find that uh, if we look into the scenario, then this is basically a three steps permutation. The first first uh, rotor gives a permutation of one by twenty six. Uh, factorial. The second is also giving a permutation of something like this, and third also gives a permutation of something like this. Yeah. So, so looking at these things, uh, we have. So, if we analyze the enigma, then the bombing machine is basically tries to make the reverse of the process. He has he has all the possibilities, and he tries all the possibilities, and ultimately hit into the part. Okay. Okay, so these are all the uh, symmetric. So now we try to find that how the encryption algorithms work. So how the key, how what is the function of the key? The key, depending on the function of the key, we divide the uh, encryption algorithms into two parts. One is called the symmetric, and another is called the asymmetric part. The symmetric is basically the same key is used, or the same configurations are used, or same randomness is used in the sender side and the receiver side. Okay, and all the all the mechanisms, all the encryption mechanisms uh, in the first order, second order, uh, after the second order, they are basically all the symmetric encryption. Okay. The asymmetric encryption use a different scenarios. Uh, we'll come to the asymmetric key, but before we before we try to understand how the symmetric encryption works. So Enigma or the uh, German machines. Uh, the Japanese machine, the French machines, all machines are basically the symmetric cipher. So the sender and the receiver, they has a common configurations of the machine. Okay. So after the machine, uh, uh, second order, people understood that machine will be replaced by some algorithm. So we will have some uh, computational scenarios where uh, this computational scenario will, will encrypt the systems and will encrypt the message and they will be transmitted. So at that time the IBM, IBM is basically a uh, company, they develop the personal computers. So personal computers are available after 1966. Okay. So after 1966 the uh, IBM uh, desktop or IBM um, uh, personal computers are uh, in the market. And then uh, we then IBM also tries to develop the, some uh, encryption mechanisms which can be deployed on the on the computers or the desktop machines. Okay. And that times there are two uh, two scientists or there are two mathematicians in the IBM. One is the Fiestel and the Coppersmith. So they Fiestel and Coppersmith they comes with a permutation uh, permutation block and the sub substitution box that we have already discuss in the scissor cipher we have a permutation block and the substitution block and and they uh, in the fiestal they uh, proposed the permutation block and the coppersmith proposed the substitution block uh, in 1973 then ibm proposed a encryption mechanism which is called the lucifer so lucifer was the first uh, symmetric encryption algorithm so before that we have the machines so uh, ibm uh, came with a proposal of the Lucifer, which was the first symmetric key encryption mechanism or algorithm. And this, and then the National Bureau of Standards, that is the standard or uh, US standard organization, they adopt or they standardize the Lucifer with the name of data encryption standard in 1977. So the journey of the algorithmic part starts in the 1993, followed by 1997. But, the, but there are some con, uh, there are some uh, some some types of uh, uh, what is called 
a contradiction. And there are some types of uh, some types of <coughs> against this data encryption status. Some some words or some things happens in the uh, against of the data encryption standard. So IBM did not publish the design of the substitution block. So the Fiestal block, uh, IBM designed uh, as a research work, and they never published the uh, published the uh, backside mathematics of this uh, substitution block. They only it says that how the substitution can be performed. If you look into the IBM uh, AES data AES algorithms, you will find that they said okay, if the, if the alphabet is A, we have to substitute with something like that. But it, uh, why we have to substitute by uh, some? Why we have to substitute uh, in that fashion? That mathematics or that technology or that background things has not been published by the IBM. Okay. So during 1997, uh, there was an attack which is called the differential tip analysis. Okay. So after 20 years of times, after performing 20 years of time. Uh, there was an attack which is called the differential cap analysis, and this attack, uh, this attack proves that IBM has some. IBM knew that, that there was some vulnerability in the systems, and uh, knowing these things, IBM did not publish the design of the substitution block. Okay, so uh, so the question is that if if IBM knew this, thing, if IBM knew that okay, there was some problems in the, the system. Uh, and then these systems is standardized by the U.S. government, and they perform the 20 years of journey. Then, uh, did IBM have the backdoor to decrypt all the messages which has been performed by the DS encryption? So that is the main question. So, we, so people, you raise the question that did IBM lose all the decryptions of the uh, of the DS ciphers? So that was the main thing. So we have also a question marks about this thing. So after after making this attack in 1997, uh, there was a call for the uh, uh, there was a device which is developed by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We call these things EFF. Electronic Frontier Foundation develop a deep cracker. Deep cracker is is a machine uh, which which embeds number of chips. There were some row and columns of chips, and using this number is using this deep cracker system. Uh, the DS cipher can be broken into 56 hours. Okay. So the history starts with the in 1997. Then, uh, after 20 years of journey, the first theoretical attack was there, which is called the differential tip analysis. And this attack uh, raised the question that whether IBM knows all the ciphers which has been performed by the DS encryption. And at the at the very next year, uh, there was a device which uh, which was uh, developed by the uh, EFF, and that device shows that uh, the uh, DES encryption, DES cipher could be broken, could be broken in uh, in a 56 hours. So after that, uh, there was a call uh, for the new encryption standard uh, in 1999, and finally, uh, I, DES has been replaced by the new encryption standard, which is called the AES Advanced Encryption Standard in 2000. Uh, 2000 or 2001. Now, presently, uh, none of the uh, none of the implementation or uh, we do not have any implementation which are using the test. Uh, we are basically using the AES system. So your bank accounts or your bank login, you will find that uh, there is a message that uh, your your uh, data will be encrypted with 256 bits of key. So this 256 bits of key is not uh, not suitable for the test. This has a uh, key size of 58 bits. Yeah. So now AES provides you a security which is which is basically a, uh, a 256 bits of key. Uh, so AES is based on the uh, on a mathematics which is called the uh, Galois field two to the power eight or the extension field of uh, binary uh, binary two to the power eight. Okay, and all the design now, whatever the uh, insights of the AES, all the designs are now public. So I can use uh, I can use the uh, literature of the AES, and I can design my own AES systems. But this is uh, this is not like that. There are some hidden things. I have to just uh, just take that things granted. 
the main problem in the uh, symmetry key encryption is basically the key distribution problem the, the thing is that uh, say if i am using a symmetry key encryption say there is a sender there is a receiver and uh, i have to communicate the message so i have a secret m and i have to communicate the message the it assumes that there is a prior negotiation of the common key so both sender and receiver must have a uh, common secret that is the key so and, and nobody else the adversary who stands here he he does not know the value of key or he does not have the uh, position of key so now this 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 gives you a logical question that if sender and receiver has a prior negotiation of the key uh, with some mechanism say i i don't know. with some mechanisms i have i and you have a prior negotiation of the key in such a way that nobody else uh, has the knowledge of this key then why should i have a, another mechanism to uh, to make a secret communication of the message so i can use the previous mechanisms where uh, the prior negotiation has been established so instead of the key i can i can have a i can use the mechanisms to have a uh, communication of the message m okay. so that is that gives you something a question which is called the chicken and egg problem okay. so if i can uh, if i can do a prior negotiations of a key then that that mechanism can be used to communicate the message that is the main question so uh, what about the parts that the assumptions was something like that so i must have a prior negotiation of the key and using this key i can uh, i can make the um, combination to be secure okay so the problem is basically how how we can have a prior negotiation of the key how can we have the distribution of the key so how receiver will distribute the key uh, to the sender in a public channel such that nobody else can understand what a receiver has been said okay. so that is the main issue the key distribution problem is basically uh, uh, known uh, or it is it is it is the questions after the second order or during the second order during the second order uh, enigma machines were established so the machines were established but the thing is that every day they the truth has to set their combinations then uh, these combinations are secret to the particular truth so truth one and truth two we have to set a particular combination then how how can i how the truth one and truth two will come to a common agreement that they will set a uh, uh, configurations of the machine that is the main problem and they, they, this problem is called the key distribution problem so how they will come to a common agreement of a part such, such that nobody else understood the common agreement okay so prior to 1966 uh, uh, there was no algorithm uh, for the key distribution problem the first uh, proposal was uh, by the Diffie and Hellman. The Diffie Hellman gives you the first uh, key agreement problem, which is called that, uh, which is based on the discrete logarithm scenario. The discrete logarithm scenario uh, is a mathematical problem. It says that in a in a finite group, I uh, I have a computation of say x to the power uh, DLT or discrete logarithm problem. It says that in a finite group. So I can compute x to the power a uh, mod of n easily, but I cannot compute a which is equivalent to log, uh, say this is y, log y base of x in modulo of n. So this computation is difficult to perform. So this is difficult to perform. Yeah. So exponentiation is easy to do but finding the uh, finding the exponent is difficult to perform so that is called the discrete log problem and based on this discrete log problem the defi and hellman proposed the first uh, key distribution signal okay so the history says that we start from the second order where we move from electronic to uh, in, sorry in the second order we move from um, manual messaging to the uh, machine made me mechanism so once the machine is appearing then uh, then after the second world war we have a general purpose machine like a computer 
So this general purpose machine is used for encryption and the decryption. And then we move from machine to our algorithms. So once the algorithms came, then we have a history of the days. The days starts in 1997, then it runs for around 25 years, and then it was replaced by the AES. So all these things are symmetric. Then uh, the, the problem uh, faces means uh, during that uh, during the symmetric cipher, the problem of key distribution is the main problem. So the key distribution was first uh, solution was came in 1976 by the Defi and Hellman. So once that key distribution problem comes, then we have a different type of uh, notion. It's, it says that using a public channel, I can make a secure combination. So the thing is that. Uh, the public channel is open, so everybody is listening to the public channel. Instead, uh, the two parties can have a, a negotiations of a secret. So that is the main solution in the asymmetric encryption. The asymmetric encryption says that using without without having any prior prior negotiation of the key, is it possible to communicate a secret message? And that solution is proposed by the asymmetric encryption. So the the notion of the asymmetric key was realized during the World War II because uh, the troops were uh, were fighting or troops were basically in a position to having a common negotiation of the uh, of the key. That was the, that that problem was realized in the uh, in the asymmetric key in the World War II. And then after the world after the World War II, British government, British military, they worked hard to develop an asymmetric key encryption. And there was a person who, whose name is uh, we sometimes call these things as Ellis. He, he was he was uh, offered to develop a system for this uh, asymmetric encryption. So uh, Ellis was not a, a mathematician. He is basically a philosopher. So he he proposed some techniques. He proposed some mechanism that in this way we can do. Okay. But the thing was realized by the. Cox. Cox is basically a mathematician, a young person who after graduate, he joined the British military in the age of say 23 or 22. He joined the uh, military and that's at, when he joined the uh, British military, he was assigned by the proposal of Ellis and uh, and very short time means within a day or two, he come he came with a proposal which is which is uh, the asymmetric encryption and that proposal was accepted accepted by the British government or the British military. Okay. So British military was the first who, who understood or who has the de deployment of or who has the development of the asymmetric encryption. And that development was due to this elites and the courts. Okay. But this proposal was not the public proposal. This, they, that algorithms was not public. So that was only uh, used by the British government. So in 1973, uh, that takes is available with the British military. But uh, in the 1977, there was three person uh, from the MIT, uh, Massachusetts, the Rebus, Samir and Adelman. They come with the algorithm which is called the RSA and based on the factorization problem. The factorization problem says that you can easily multiply two, uh, two numbers. Uh, there are um, uh, easy multiplication algorithms for doing the multiplication. But it is difficult to factor the composite into its prime. So if I have a large number, which is a composite number and odd, then we don't have a uh, easy solution for factorizing the number into this prime. And depending on this hardness, the RSA crypto system was developed in 1997. And after then, uh, in 1985, uh, there was an, another crypto system which is developed uh, based on the discrete logarithm problem. And it was due to the L command. So the first, if you look into the history, you'll find that uh, the key distribution problem was solved uh, by the discrete logarithm problem in 1976. Then in the 1977, the first asymmetric encryption came. Uh, after one year, the asymmetric encryption came. But that was not due to the discrete logarithm problem. That was due to the factorization problem. And after uh, around eight years or nine years, the first asymmetric encryption, which was based on the discrete logarithm problem, came in 1985. Okay. So, so we have a solution in 1976 uh, uh, by discrete logarithm problem. Then 1977, we have the solution of asymmetric encryption uh, based on the factorization problem. 
and then after around uh, around say nine years we have an another solution of asymmetric encryption based on the discrete operand top so so that is basically some irony irony says that the factorization problem is known uh, even into the ancient age uh, so everybody uh, so it the fact, factor factorizing of composite is difficult it's known everybody even into the a uh, into the uh, say, say 17th century or 16th century people knows this things but nobody came with the solution so there, there was a time it was basically uh, uh, a fact that nobody could develop an algorithm based on this uh, based on this property uh, asymmetric encryption cannot be developed or that the fact says that knowing the knowing the basic things that, that factorization is hard but it was not instantiated the factorization uh, factorization problem can be uh, can be solved by asymmetric encryption that things cannot be initiated, instantiated that is that is an irony okay okay so behind all these things there are there are another contributions of the mathematics that first contribution is that the uh, the primality test or uh, again there is a uh, there is a chicken and egg problem it says that um, uh, that i i cannot actually every asymmetric and encryption problem like rsa and the discrete lock problem or elgama rsa and the elgama uh, the design or the algorithm basically needs a big prime number big prime number in the sense a prime number which which is a uh, at least of size of 5 to 12 bits so i need a prime number whose uh, whose who size is basically 5 to 12 bits okay so now the question is that how can i find a prime number something like that how can i find a prime number whose size is 1 uh, 5 to 12 bits okay. so so the, there is no such database we don't have a database of all possible primes for, from where i can randomly pick a pick a things so i have to pick a random element random odd element and i have to check whether this element is a prime or not yeah. and checking of uh, element to be a prime or not i have to check whether it can be factored into its composite or not. Yeah. and then the problem is precise the problem uh, looks into the same things that factorization is a hard problem so i know that factorization cannot be performed but i try to conclude some things by using the concept of factorization and that is basically a uh, chicken and egg problems yeah. then the thing is that do we have some another mechanisms to have a primality test and then we have uh, have a proposal by milan and robin milan and robin says that there is a there is a probabilistic primality primality test the probabilistic primality test says that uh, i i have to test a number n to be a prime the result will give me a composite with a probability of 1 it says that uh, if the result says n is composite then indeed the number is a composite number but if the test says that n is prime then there is a probability associated with these things the probability is is something 1 minus 1 by 2 to the power t yeah so this factor 1 minus 1 by 2 to the power t is basically an asymptotic notation it, it it is it looks something like this so uh, it looks something like this so this is the probability of 1 and the curve 1 minus 1 by 2 to the power t if t is say 1 then it is half if t is 2 then it is threefold then this will be 7, 7 by 8. So this is 7 by 8, this is 3 by 4, or uh, not like that. It will be 7 by 8 here. This will be 3 by 4. This will be half. So when t is 1, when t is 1, then it is half. If t is 2, then when t is 2, then it is 3 by 4. t is 3, then it is 7 by 8. In this way, it it is asymptotically towards the value of one okay. so the primal test is is having two parameters one is one is called the number the number to be test for primality and another is the security parameter so security parameter is t so as we increase the parameter it is more asymptotic towards the value of one okay so this uh, these techniques or this concept 
it concepts something like this uh, a number is is probable with a probability of half that means the number may be a composite or may be a prime now if we run the pro run the test for the uh, security parameter of three it says that the number is for is prime with a probability of seven by eight so it is almost it is more clear, closer to the value of one and if we run the program with the security parameter of 32 then it it is almost to the value of one that means the number is uh, can be considered for a prime because it is uh, it is almost having a probability of one so we don't have a uh, have a deterministic signal we cannot say a number is a prime but we can say the number is a composite if the number is composite we can easily say the number is composite but we cannot say that number is prime we, can, we always have a probability associated with these things so all the all this implementation of the rsa or the elgama they have a probabilistic primality test and uh, they they randomly pick a odd number of a particular size they fit it into a probabilistic test and if the probability if the probabilistic test is prime then it is used for the algorithm and the second part is obviously the factorization and the discrete log problem is hard so and so still now we don't have any any uh, polynomial time algorithm for the uh, factorizations of the discrete logarithm problem so all these algorithms are basically called a sub exponential algorithms the sub exponential algorithms look something like this say uh, say say this is the polynomial algorithm the growth of the polynomial algorithms is looking like this yeah the growth of the exponential algorithms is something like this so this is the polynomial growth this is the exponential growth and sub exponential algorithms are in between of this part yeah so there is a parameter this is called the sub exponential so there is a parameter which is called that alpha parameter so if alpha is one then this sub exponential algorithm tends to the value of uh, exponential if alpha is zero then sub exponential is fall down to a polynomial part so we are not going to the details but the thing is something like this presently we have a number number theory uh, number field cb method in 1999 which which gives that alpha is one by three so still now we are we are fighting to be alpha one by three and we are sorry one by three and which is not uh, that much acceptable in space one by three does not give a sense of polynomial so we are looking for alpha which is almost the value of zero then we have a uh, scenario for the polynomial uh, algorithm okay. so apart from uh, so the uh, gist of this thing is saying that that uh, the factorization is a hard problem the factorization uh, and the discrete logarithm problem both of these problems are basically considered to be uh, to be a hard hard in the sense we don't have polynomial algorithm to solve the factorizations but still we are we are working with the sub exponential algorithms which tends to be a polynomial when alpha is to be a value of zero but no no way we are having this type of solution the most efficient uh, sub exponential uh, says that the value of alpha is basically uh, one third okay so this uh, these are the facts of the uh, encryption so what do we, what do we understand in the encryption part is basically there there is a mechanism which is public and this mechanism is used for the for the transformation of the message to a cipher and uh, and the counter mechanism is used for the transformation cipher to message and the mechanisms are not the secret mechanisms are public the uh, the randomness which are used for the encryption are basically the secret part. Okay. Then we we have the development and we have the characteristics of different types of encryption mechanism. Okay, so now uh, there is an another part uh, of the uh, of the security which is called the 
obscursion. Obscursion is basically says that how we make the things difficult to understand. So there are two sentences, there are two uh, two uh, paragraphs. So human can easily read these things. So according to the research at Cambridge University, uh, it does not matters in what order uh, the letters in a word are. Yeah. So you'll find that if you closely look into this uh, sentence, you'll find that there if there are words which are having some misplaced, some letter. So if you look into this letter, so these are basically a misplaced. But human human can easily read these things. Yeah. So the prop, the thing is that if this if this sent uh, if this paragraph is is faded to a computer which is which is basically designed for english english language then he will, this this computer will unable to understand the uh, meaning of these things they, it will find that these are the errors and these uh, the words are not in the dictionaries and they that will unable to get into the meaning similarly if you look into the second paragraph it says you, you can easily read these things so but every words are mis mis uh, spelled or they are they are jum jumbled but human can easily read this thing so human perception says that uh, if we if we change the if we keep the first and the last alphabet uh, intact and jumble the in other intermediate alphabets or if we keep the first and the last alphabets of a syllable intact and jumble the uh, other part then human can easily read the part but put it into a computer then the computer is unable to read the things okay. so there are some uh, there are some questions. The question says that the machine can a machine read the sentence. The machine cannot read this sentence, but human can read this sentence. So what is the uh, what is the advantage? The advantage is that uh, there are some systems, and this we we create some difficulties for the systems, and this creating the difficulties is basically called the obscuration. Okay. So I can create difficulties for a particular system uh, like computer is having the difficulty to, to read these things. Yeah. The question of obscuration depends on the entity or uh, on who, who is going to interpret the part. So human cannot uh, having the difficulty to interpret the part, but machine will having the difficulty to interpret the part. So in another example, so this is basically a C program. Yeah. It's written in some different way. Yeah. And this is again called the obscuration. So what is the what is the uh, utility of this thing? So now human is human is having the difficulty to read this C program. So I, as a programmer or even a efficient programmer, he will have difficulties to read this program. But if if this program is feed into a computer, the computer will easily compile these things without any error, and it will create the uh, executions of the program. Okay. So so now. The thing is different. The uh, entities are different. Now the obscuration mechanisms are also different. The, the obscuration is basically to create the difficulty. So now computer, it has no it, computer has no difficulty to read and understand the, this program. But human will having the difficulty to read and understand this program. Yeah. So why you do this? Thing? The, the doing these things is basically we call these things as a software obscuration. So the utility or making these things something like that say i am a i am a uh, developer i i develop a source code and i uh, sell it to some company yeah or some company offers me to develop a source code uh, and give the company pay for that yeah now uh, as a developer i i i produce a source code to the company now this company will use my source code and make a uh, higher business so he can use the source code and he can do some business over that part okay. so to, to to protect these things or to, to prevent this business to prevent my intellectual part uh, and use that things by another company to make profit so softwares are basically obscure so before we provide the software or before we provide the source code there are some automated tool which are used to obscure the software and the instead of giving the uh, giving the plain source code or giving the simple source code the obscure source code are basically provided okay so that is one type of information hiding so the information is basically the source code 
the organizations or the block structure of the source code, the loop structure of the source code, the definitions of the arrays, etc., etc. All these things are basically hide. So I give something a stuff, uh, and this stuff will run. This this source code will perform correctly, but you will unable to uh, reuse the source code for different other purpose. That is the main uh, utility of these things. So there is basically a uh, one consent. Uh, there is basically a uh, competition which is called the uh, uh, international obstruction of C code context. Yes, yeah, so in this uh, in the Google's you will find these things. There, there is a web page and you will find that there are different types of software obstructions are available. So uh, this program what it does. It basically reads the source code. So this program will read the, read the same file and it will uh, reduce the size. Of, this is basically a figure of a uh, of a, a guard, a face of a guard. So it will reduce the uh, size by just uh, deleting the alternative lines and deleting the alternative alphabets. Yeah. So if there are uh, 30, uh, say 40 lines, that's if we run the program, then you will find another file which having a 20 number of lines because it will delete the alternative lines and then it will also delete the alternative alphabets. So in this way, the, the size of this uh, figure or the size of this uh, texture will be reduced by half and again reduced by half. In this way, this program executes. So what about the parts? The thing is uh, something like this. We are not using the encryption mechanism because uh, we have to produce the uh, plain text. Like I have to, I have to give in the source code. I cannot encrypt the source code and say that use this encrypted source code for your purpose. I have to give you the source code. Yeah. But I have to give you the plain text. Yeah. But at the same time, I have to hide my design. So how can I hide my design? So I have to obstruct the process. Okay. So this is the basic difference between the cryptography and the obstruction. So there is. Uh, cryptography is basically a bijection. Bijection means uh, there is a one to one mapping. So I have there is a message and then there is a cipher. They are having a one to one correspondence. One correspondence, I have a reverse of this process. Okay. The security is basically uh, depends on the computational bounded part and the computational theory, information theory part. And this is the third point is important. It follows the Kirchhoff's principle. It follows that how we have uh, performed the encryption is known to everybody. The second thing is that of course is that there is a one to many mapping. The one to many mapping means I can I can I can the source code in different. So this is one type of obstruction. Then I can do the I can redesign the problem problem in a different uh, different types of obstruction. Yeah. So uh, the thing is that one source code. One source code may be obscured in a in a different way. So there is a one to many mapping. Okay. And that gives me the difficulties. The difficulties is defined in in the perceptions of the interpreter. So how interpreter will try to understand means uh, if I if I give a indented form of a uh, program, then interpreter can easily in, in, interpret this. Thing. So I, I basically disturb the indented part of the program. So how the loop structure organized, how the each structure organized, I have basically uh, disturbed all these things. Yeah. And it does not provide, it does not follow the culture principle. The main thing is that, uh, that how we have obscured the source code is not public. So I do the obscuration. If, if the technique is known to you, then it, you, you can easily reverse the process. So this obstruction technique is not known to the uh, to the receiver. Uh, so that is the main difference of the two parts. The purpose are, uh, are different. One thing is that I want to communicate a secret message and I the second part is that I want to hide some uh, some design concept or I have, I have want to hide some things which 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 is apart from the plain text that I want to hide. Okay. So these are the uh, interpretations of the part. So here uh, you can understand that the cartoons are also uh, saying that. So reaching to the top of this building, there are some obstructions. So uh, instead of doing the boundary gate, something like that, uh, I put something uh, difficulty to reach to the top of this building. So that is the main part of the obstruction. Okay. 
so there is an another part of the scenario which is called the deniability uh, of the deniability or pollution so deniability is basically a scenario where uh, where there is a uh, there is sometimes called the uh, course or the law enforcement 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 agency so it is something like this say say there is a sender who sent some encrypted cipher who sent some cipher yeah, to the receiver yeah. now previously we are considering the adversary so adversary they this adversary uh, captures the cipher and tries to get the meaning of the cipher now we we replace this adversary by a forcer so forcer is a party or he is basically uh, 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 means powerful party who captures the cipher who get the cipher c and instead of trying to dictate the cipher he asks the sender or he he put the sender in a position to reveal the pen text yeah and and he put the center with some say, put, it, put him in front of a gun or something like that he basically forced the center to di disclose his plain text okay. so so we call these things as a uh, as a rubber source uh, rubber hose uh, tip analysis rubber hose tip analysis is basically he will be beaten he will be tortured uh, the center will be tortured or he will be uh, uh, he will be in a position uh, he'll be not. Uh, he'll be beaten, or he'll be some uh, mentally or physically tortured to reveal the plain text. So in this in this scenario, uh, how can I? How can the sender keep his message to be secure? Yeah. So the plain cryptographic algorithm does not work because uh, in the plain cryptographic algorithms, we assume that the adversary performs the attacks offline he is not interacting he is not uh, not communicating or he is not interacting with the center not the receiver he is performing at his uh, end uh, to break the system but courser is a different scenario courser is basically forcing or he is basically forcing the sender or the receiver to disclose the secret yeah so in this case uh, is it possible to uh, put my information to be secure and to do these things, we have a concept of denable or uh, polishable uh, uh, encryption mechanism. Okay. So, in uh, so this is also practical. The, the practical in the sense there are different countries where uh, where the law is uh, saying that there is a key disclosure law. The key disclosure law uh, in, means uh, enforce or it enforces a uh, party to disclose the secret. Yeah, there are uh, countries like India, Australia, etc., US, UK, they have the key enforcement law. Yeah. And similarly, there are other countries where key enforcement law is not applicable, like uh, Switzerland, Iceland, uh, Czech, Czech, Czech Republic. In those countries, the laws are not applicable. Yeah. So, so if the key enforcement law is applicable, then the law enforcement agency can uh, can force you or he will he has the right to force you for demanding the uh, private key. Okay. or even uh, there are some courses sometimes we call these things as a, in the boutique scenario we are having the uh, vote trigger so there is a there is a concept of vote rigging so in an online boutique, boutique scenario there is a concept of rigging and rigging is basically one type of forcing you send a vote uh, encrypted vote then the adversary will capture the encrypted code, come to you and ask for the dec uh, decryption of this part. He will not try to decrypt the code. He will come to you and he will force you to decrypt the message or decrypt the cipher. That is the main issue. Okay. The polishable denarity and is a mechanism to hide the secret when there is an attack of rubber source. Rubber source basically you understand this picture. So in this case, uh, uh, the cryptographer will will try to break the system by planning say uh, planning for something but the rubber source will not try to break the system he will he will ask the uh, party and keep on beating to disclose the private key so that is the main difference okay. so in this case uh, can the sender have some 
fake message and the fake key such that the encryption of the fake uh, fake message and the fake key it results to a same size so if i have a scenario something like this say say there is a true message there is a true key and we have a encryption we have the cipher c yeah. can we have the same encryption mechanism but identify a fake message and the fake key such that their encryption is also the cipher c then the sender has a uh, advantage so so if he calls he will not reveal the uh, true message true key he will reveal the fake message and the fake key and prove or possibly he can able to prove that uh, instead of sending this m and k uh, he has encrypted the message m x okay. and m f is in favor of the person so considering that m f is basically uh, in favor of course yeah. so course are will happy with this with this result so uh, so so deniable encryption is basically a scenario where i have a fake message and the fake cipher such that the encryption of the fake message and the cipher results to the same cipher text. so that is basically what we have said so there is a message m and there are some fake messages so these are the set of all possible things. We have a message M and we have the fake message M1, M2, all belongs to the message space M. And then there is a denial encryption, which are having the encryption and the decryption mechanism and the key generation. So these key generation mechanisms uh, will produce a with true key. So the KD is basically the true key and KF1, KF2 are basically the fake keys. So in such a way that the encryption of the true message with the true key is equivalent with the encryption of the uh, fake message M1 with the fake uh, key F, F, uh, KF1 is equivalent with the encryption of uh, fake message M2 with the fake key KF2. Okay. Now if Corsair appears to the uh, sender and uh, demand for the decryption, the sender will hide the true message and he will reveal that one of the message is a month as a fake and he will re reveal the fake message and he will reveal the fake in this way he will uh, avoid uh, or he he can uh, conceal his pri private message and and be safe okay. understand now the question is that does it helps so so does this scenario helps in the part okay. so does policy policyability helps it, there are two scenarios where i will show that policyability will uh, will not help and then another scenario where we show that policyability can help the uh, sender the first thing is that uh, uh, that we understand that there is a, a courser who is uh, who is coursing the sender for revealing their private keys okay. so now we try to design these things as, as a game the game is something like this there is a uh, this is the sender sender uh, has no hidden key means he has no hidden information he has the he ha he does not wants to uh, deny so he does not have any effect and he has some hidden key. so he has the sender has some hidden keys okay and this is basically the uh, courser. The courser stop torturing and the courser keep on tor torturing. Okay. So this is the sender. Sender may have some hidden keys. This sender does not have any hidden key. This is the courser keep on torturing. The courser does not keep on it does not torture. See stop torturing. So these are the utility of the uh, of the uh, of this uh, A is called the acquisition. And this is the lover's squad, is the person who, call, who basically tortures. The utility says that uh, if he has, if uh, if uh, this acquisition do not have any or does not have any hidden key, and the 
the rubber square has got torture. Then he has a utility of minus two and nine. The minus nine in the sense that minus two in the sense that he is unable to uh, he is unable to hide the information because he has disclosed the uh, the key and receiver has or this uh, rubber squad has uh, known the private uh, known the private information. So adversary or this sorry this acquisition has revealed this plain text and and this squad he has learned the plain text. So his utility is minus two and his utility is nine because he learned the plain text. The second thing is that he has some hidden key. That means he keeps the message secret and uh, squad has stopped torturing us. That means his uh, acquisition uh, utility is dead because he can keep the message secret because uh, he has some hidden key uh, which keeps the message secret and uh, there is no torture further. And the uh, um, utility of the squad is basically minus 10 because he has not learned the secret. Okay. And the second part says that uh, the acquisition does not have any hidden key. Okay. And he keeps on torture. Means even I don't have any anything uh, anything to be hidden, but I am I am keep on torture. So my utility is minus 10. So my I am in a worst scenario. And our his utility is 10 in the sense that already he has done, already the squad has learned the secret. But he keeps on torturing the part. So his utility is at least nine, and it is put in as a ten. And the second part is that both of them uh, are in in a fighting mode. So the sender, the acquisition has hidden keys, and the uh, rubber squad had torturing the part. So his utility is minus five, and his utility is uh, five. That means adversary. Still, he is uh, sorry. Acquisition. Still, he is able to keep his message secret, and uh, Robert Scott. He, still, he has unable to learn the secret. So these are the. This is the game, and looking into the game, we find that uh, which one is the aggressive. The aggressive is that uh, that there is a dominant strategy. The dominant strategy is that adversary always keep on torturing and. Um, uh, Sorry, uh, yes, adversary is always keep on torturing, and the uh, acquisition is always try to keep his places to be hidden. So, because uh, because this is 10 is basically his utility, which is greater than minus 5. So, so acquisition always tries to keep his places uh, secret because 10 is basically uh, the utility which is greater than minus 2, minus 5, and minus 10. Yeah. So, he always tries to be in this state. Similarly, uh, uh, rubber Scott, he always tries to be in this state because here 10 is basically his, his utility, which is uh, greater than all the other position. So, so this game says that uh, policyability will not help you because as as long as you keep as long as you uh, want to keep your message secret, you will be tortured by the uh, squad because uh, squad has a has a uh, greater uh, utility for keep on torturing you, and you are also having a greater utility to keep your message secret. Okay, so policyability will not help you. The second thing is that byte dynamic. Byte dynamic says that uh, both the sender and the receiver. Uh, so uh, both are basically in a position. So both are uh, both are under the inter interrogations of the rubber square. So sender is also interrogated by the square. This receiver is also interrogated by the square, okay? and they are interrogated in a separate room. So uh, during this interrogation, uh, this uh, this receiver and the center is unable to communicate with each other, and then this game results to a uh, prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma is basically uh, parent optimal parent optimization. So that says that uh, that says that uh, keeping keeping the secret means uh, parent optimus basically says that sender also uh, also have the greater utility to keep his basis to be secret and receiver also have the uh, greater utility to keep his basis secret so this is basically the parent optimus where uh, sender also uh, keeps the uh, message secret and receiver also keeps the message secret okay but 
assuming that when we are keeping in this when we are playing with a bite dynamic then we also assume that the, that keeping the pace secret is is better than the torture means uh, means the punishment when we reveal the secret is greater than the uh, prison torture scenario okay. if we consider these things then it becomes a very optimized solution so so uh, we have the solution for the denial in future the denialty will have a technical solution denial will keep your technical solution to make a <coughs> fake message and the fake key. but if we go if we look into the uh, into the rationality means what is the rational behavior of the of the sender and what is the rational behavior of the uh, upper square then we find that uh, denialty will not help okay. but denialty can help in a scenario where there is a receiver and the, there is a sender and both are under under the interrogations of the lava square and in that case it it helps me in a parity optimization scenario uh, that both party will have a better utilization or have a, a mutual better utilization to not revealing their private key okay. and uh, now the question is that why do we use this uh, this uh, part so we cannot use this part when uh, when we are under the under the law agency something like that yeah so denialty will help you in in in, in particular applications like uh, electronic voting or uh, or electronic auction scenarios yeah where the where the adversary is basically optimistic means he is he he, he will be happy to learn if you reveal a message uh, in favor of the adversary so the courser will happy to learn that he you are you are you have voted in favor of the courser or in favor of the reader so if you can produce a message that i have i have voted to your candidate then you will be happy happy uh, and he, he will he will let you go okay. so in that type of scenarios this policy possibility will be helping you but if you are a, uh, you are under the um, under the control of the uh said law agencies and uh, and you reveal some uh, some things different then the law agency will keep on the police on uh, in the torture room the police will keep on torturing you uh, even you have you don't have any secret still the police will be keep on torturing you because the police people are not optimistic in their scenario yeah but the, there are some applications where uh, where the legal or the adversaries are basically optimistic to learn that you have done some things uh, in favor of them okay yeah. and if you if you perform that scenario then you will then possibility will help okay yeah. okay so instead of rubber hose rubber hose basically a uh, 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 adversary whose basic intention is to keep on torturing you whether you have revealed all the keys or not okay yeah. so instead of rubber rubber hose if there is a rigor the rigor is basically adversary who is optimistic in the scenario so then we have a uh, so we have a advantage or we can use this denial encryptions to get rid of the part yeah the voting uh, so okay. so this is all about whatever we have understand by the encryption so encryption is basically uh, it starts with a general uh, data Uh, data hiding mechanisms. How can I create? How can I uh, secure my message when we transmit these things? Then we move to the obscuration. Obscuration is basically uh, instead of the message, I have some inner design or I have some inner things, and we make the uh, message to be uh, jumbled in such a way that the inner design is uh, hidden. Then we have a denialty. Denialty in the sense that uh, previously we consider that the adversary is is basically offline process the adversary does this thing so then we introduced a courser then we also understood that courser's are in different scenarios one is the rubber hose uh, who whose basic intention is to torture and the another is the uh, vote trigger or the something who who is optimistic to learn that adversary has performed on behalf of him okay. and then we come to the another scenario which is called the steganography the steganography is uh, is a Uh, is different from the cryptography. The cryptography says that we we have a we we want to make the 
message to be uh, to be clear so the media medium is basically a clear medium and inside this medium can we embed some things can we uh, can we communicate some things which 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 will carry some values yeah so like if i say you uh, tomorrow is a holiday yeah uh, saying these things uh, does it contain some hidden information in the part that is basically the part of a stereotype the stereotype is always related to uh, <coughs> to, a, to the capacity uh, to the capacity of the possibility of some entity the thing is that say uh, there is an adversary if adversary is able to perceive that okay uh, this is the difference then stereotype will not work so this is the if adversary is unable to perceive the difference then we have the uh, unable then we have the technology in practice so there is a permissible error media error in the medium so that we already discussed that uh, in in the noise say there are two two videos are played so one is one is in the uh, mp4 and one is basically a raw video so you are unable to distinguish uh, the difference yeah so one is hd video and another is non hd video if they are played on your uh, small device then you are unable to small display device then you are unable to perceive that the difference between that things so this is basically the media is having some errors so i can put some error into the media and the secret is basically we basically carries into the error erroneous part of the part so there is a uh, there is the informations and then there are some error into the informations and within this error channel i can put the uh, information the second one, stereography can be done in two ways. One is called the uh, linguistic, and one is the embedding. So, linguistic, as uh, this is basically one example that I already uh, cited that there was a Japanese doll seller who used to sell the dolls, uh, uh, dolls with a with a letter. So, this is one instance of the letter. Uh, you'll find these things in the internet. So, in this letter, he used to write that the old German uh, basis doll dressed in a uh, hull green skirt. So he used to say that uh, this letter is basically written to his customer after the uh, attack of the Pearl Harbor. So uh, in the Pearl Harbor, there are so many uh, US ships which were damaged and they taken to the uh, shipyard for the for that uh, repair or they, they are repair. Okay. So he, this, this uh, lady is sending a letter to his customer to say that there are some uh, some green scarf means there are some uh, worship which has been taken to some uh, to some hard means workshop for the maintenance so he has written around 20 or 25 letters and they are available in the internet and in this all this letter he she used to convey some messages to the uh, japanese spies yeah and so these are basically a linguistic part of scenario. The linguistic part of scenario is difficult to understand. So uh, you must have receiver and the center must have a negotiation to understand this part. So applying field. So the problem is in in the stereography is something like this: is applying some filter filter or sensor might not affect the secret. So the thing is that uh, say even there is a uh, gatekeeper who used to read this message before it is posted. Means before it is posted to the receiver say the uh, the postman or the uh, post officer he he did this thing so he applies some sensors he has some sensor mechanisms so so your technography or your linguistic part will should pass through these sensor mechanisms and otherwise this me this message will not be carried to the other part yeah so you have to de develop some uh technography mechanisms such that if there are some uh, filtering mechanisms is embedded on this process or some sensor mechanism is embedded on this process still your your uh, secrets should not be uh, cut or that should be passed through this sensor mechanism and secondly uh, it does not follow the culture of sensible the culture of sensible says that the algorithm should be public so here the algorithm is basically the secret so the receiver at the center must know that these doll are basically referring to the uh, uh, sheep one the colors or how they are basically referring to particular uh, sheep, class of uh, sheep words. Okay. So this is the linguistic, then we come to the embedding. 
embedding part. The embedding part basically defines four things. One is the cover media, then the secret, then the embedding mechanisms, then the stick object. Okay. The cover media is uh, are sometimes uh, the image, audio, video, etc. etc. So this this medium is having some permissible errors. So if I change some values in this medium, then it is difficult to perceive by the human eyes. Then we have a secret. The secret is basically a bit string. So it is not, uh, we consider secret as a simple bit string. It does not have any structure. Like uh, you, you may have an image for a secret, but before we consider these things as a stick, we convert the image or the secret as a bit string. Then we have an embedding mechanism. The embedding mechanism is how we embed the bits of the secret in the proper media. That is called the embedding mechanism. And this embedding mechanism is private and uh, they are polynomial in time. So uh, I can apply any polynomial algorithms, but secret uh, things for embedding the uh, message. Then the embedded message is called the stego message. So uh, the stego message basically carries the secret. And then we have a reverse mechanism, which is also polynomial in time uh, to keep the secret from the state. Okay. So now the thing is that uh, why? Uh, what are the medium that that are selected? The medium are uh, basically uh, selected as the image. The first medium in 1992, uh, the it was it was shown that even we alter the four list, uh, even we alter the list four significant bit plane of an image the uh, human eye cannot perceive the changes so there are two images so there is an image of some uh, photographs and there is an another image of the same photographs but the least significant four bits are altered so they have a random change into the least significant four bits of every pixels here then the human eye cannot perceive the difference between the two okay. so after this result after this result it it gives to gives the immense uh, immense uh, speed in the steganography process the steganography process is basically trying to embed the, <coughs> the secret in the least significant bit planes yeah it may be a sequential it may be a random but they tries to fit this thing into the least significant bit planes of the image yeah. So th this type of operation is called the spatial operation, where I directly operate on the pixel values. Then, uh, then uh, after the MPG4, MPG4 is basically a video encryption mechanism. So video encryption mechanism, MPG4, or we call these things as uh, H204. There is a spare mistake. This will be 264. H.264 ABC. This is basically an encoding mechanism, which says that uh, this encoding mechanism is basically a compression, compression of the uh, raw video into a smaller part. So, in previously, we have a CD or we have a uh, one hour of video which which goes into a CD or, or 6, 650, 650 MB. Okay. Now, we can put four, four uh, one hour videos or into a 640, 6, uh, 650 MB of CD. Yeah. The thing is that the video has a huge compression mechanism yeah. and these compression mechanisms are basically the DCT component. The high DCT components are uh, filtered out. Only the small DCT, uh, low DCT, uh, discrete cosine transformation comp uh, components, they are, uh, they are co carrying the maximum information of the video. Yeah. So knowing these two facts, now there is an another uh, another embedding mechanisms which are in the uh, frequency domain or the coefficient domain. The co in the coefficient domain it says that uh, if we if we alter the low frequency components, then it does not make any uh, significant change into the into the uh, video because uh, because it says that a video with having having low having a size of say. 1 KB, uh, sorry, a uh, size of 750 MB can be reduced in the size of say 200 MB. How it can be reduced? Because the low uh, high frequency components or high density components are basically discarded. Yeah. So in this way, it says that low frequency components are containing the maximum information into a video. So I can embed the low frequency components uh, into a into 
as a secret into the video and that can can be uh, carries the secret information in the video so there are two uh, two things one one thing says that you can embed the secret into the spatty LDP. The second thing says, says that you can embed the uh, secret into the low frequency components of the uh, of, uh, frequency component of the coefficients. And this two gives me the uh, back, uh, basics of the uh, embedding scenario of the state number. Okay. And then there are some adversarial uh, effect of this thing. These are some noted Part. This is basically the noted scenario. It says that in the in the in the February 5, uh, 2001, uh, a journalist from the uh, US US uh, Today he said that there there are some activities which are taken place into the uh, by hiding some informations into the photographs uh, by the terrorist. Yeah. So he says that. Uh, through weeks of in, in uh, weeks of interview with the U.S. law enforcement officers and the expert, U.S. today learns uh, new de details of how extremists hide maps and photographs of ter terrorist targets and post instruction for terrorist activities on sports channel, pornographic bulletins, uh, and other uh, popular websites. So the terrorists are using the uh, using the standard. Uh, standard media to post this type of uh, information, to post the hidden information. Uh, that has been noticed in, in the February 5, 2001. And even in the July 2001, he also says that there is a steganographic technique which are used uh, by the, uh, by the, uh, by the terrorists to convey or to communicate the terrorist activities. Yeah. And then uh, in all, all of us have understood that in uh, in September 11 there was an attack. Uh, 2001 there was an attack, which is called the Twin Tower attack by the um, in America. Yeah. and it was uh, said that uh, steganography is used for communicating the secret. Yeah. but at the same time, after doing these things, after the all this report, uh, the um, the university, uh, the university of they investigated around 3, mil 3 million images for popular website for looking steganography and they found they have not found any hidden information. Yeah. So, the, so the fact says that one side the report says that terrorists are the, the, the odd person, the, the evil persons, they are using this technique for their, uh, their benefits and the another part says that there is no evidence for this type of activities. So, so what do we learn from that? Case? We learned that the stakeholder analysis is difficult to prove because the algorithms are not known. So how we have, I have embed and how we have these algorithms are difficult to uh, difficult things, and it is very difficult to identify in a distributions of an image that where the secret message lies. So stakeholder analysis is a dream. So uh, in future, if there is a there is a technique to do the stakeholder analysis, it will be a very useful, but still now we don't have some uh, standard mechanism for the stakeholder analysis. But what are the alternatives? Al alternatives is the filtering. So filtering it says that, okay, let me do another way to uh, stop uh, stop this type of activities. So what we can do, we can do the big plane filtering. So I know that information will be available in the low big plane. So, in, so before we, before every image goes into the website, let filter the let uh, filter the low bit. Plane. So we put some random error into the low bit plane, such that stego information can be destroyed. So low pass filter. The low pass filter says that you uh, so in the in the another part the coefficient domain you apply some noise, then you apply some low pass filter such that the stego information can be destroyed. And then another part is the re-encryption. Say I upload an image. With a uh, with some BMP, so do let it re-encrypt with a lossy encryption JPEG. So doing these things as a JPEG, then information will be lost. So instead of going for the stego analysis to find uh, where the where the secret is that where what is the secret is that, let me destroy the secret. That is the alternative part of the scenario. Okay. And finally, we conclude the part. So whatever we have. Uh, we have made a two hours of journey 
over the part is basically we try to understand how cryptography works, how obstruction works, linear media and the stenography works. And then we try to understand what is the basic difference between those mechanisms. Yeah. So stenography has the uh, cryptography has some basic difference between the stenography. What is the they follows the Kirchhoff principles. Stenography does not follow this. Thing. Cryptography follows uh, mechanisms where we we which is basically the uh, non uh, means noticeable communication. So if adversary notice that there are some things is uh, happening in the channel, stenography is another part which is innocent communication. The adversary or the attacker uh, attacker is not able to notice that something is happening. Yeah. And then there are so another thing subject. So these are the mechanisms. Then we also study the attack mechanisms. How the attacks are also happening on this uh, cryptographic part or the denialability uh, or the stigmatic part. And then we also study or we also describe how the sustainability. If there are some attacks, then how we will sustain with this part. So that is all about the uh, lecture. And we thanks for your attention. Any question? Any question from the audience? Oh, let me stop my video. Sorry. Okay. Okay, I think uh, no. So thank you, sir. Thank you for enriching us with such a resourceful session. Our participants will surely improve themselves for the knowledge uh, they have acquired from this session and with this session. Now we will depart for one hour lunch break and meet at our next session of the day at sharp 3.15 p.m. And the meeting link will be same. OK, so thank you. So let me disconnect. Thank you.